No, we're going to keep it open. No, no. Could, could you open it, please? You want it open? Yes. Okay. Hygiene ma measures. Health, uh, health reasons, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon live from the Swiss Pavilion. My name is Dan Tiderini. I'm here at the Swiss Pavilion project, uh, working as a project manager. And today we are very happy to be hosting this fabulous event on mobility as a service. Before I dive into the topic, I'd like to introduce you to Swissnex. So Swissnex is an agency of the Swiss government which is promoting Swiss education, research and innovation abroad and also connecting our university startups and innovative companies to equivalents from the innovation hotspots throughout the entire world. And as you know, the Expo and the UAE is one of the, innovative, the most innovative hotspots there are on the planet. And so we're very thrilled to be hosting our colleagues from the UAE University here in collaboration with the IGLU Center and also the EPFL and the EPFL Middle East. So we're going to talk today about mass mobility as a service. And we're going to be sharing best practices between the UAE, the UAE, between Switzerland and throughout the world. And the aim of today is for us to start writing, to start comprising a report from the different partners, which will then be published and which will serve as a nice bridge between different nations in the world to look at the future of mass in its short term, medium and also long term. So I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Zanatti, the Dean of the College of IT from the UAE University. Professor Zanatti. Thank you very much. Thank you for that nice welcome and for kind words. Um, I want to say thank you. I'm honored to be here. Uh, we are also honored to have Professor Ali Murad, who is the Vice uh, Provost of uh, Research and who uh, has been playing an extremely important role here in the in, in, in this amazing event, really, I've just I've, I, I've been many, many places in my life, and I have not seen something like this before. So, congratulations, Dr. Ali, very well done. Uh, I would like to thank everybody who is here. As uh, uh, our uh, previous speaker said, uh, we are doing a workshop in a, in a topic that uh, that uh, uh, has been really researched and then talked about. There is innumerable workshops that happened. There's many things that actually took place the last decade or so. And the question is why yet another shop about more or less uh, workshop about the same thing. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that there's some encouraging development in this space. If you have been following autonomous driving and all the things that have been happening recently, uh, there is also awareness of transportation to be a very serious problem in the near future. And the United Nations puts it in one of the sustainable development uh, uh, issues that, that they have in the next 10 or 15 years from now. I think that's very important. Um, but however, despite this, this, this progress that we have made, there's a lot to be uh, done and remains to be done. Um, specifically, uh, barriers regarding r the realization what is really intended by mass. And you will see that, hopefully, this will emerge through our discussions, that even the definition about what mass is about still remains to be, still remains debatable in some way. And different people are introducing this concept in different way. Um, for me, the reality of mass is a journey that requires a comprehensive approach that includes three important things. The first one is strategic thinking. What I mean by that, Models, new models, market models that are driven by collaborative effort, which is not happening here very, uh, very often, and then uh, involvement of the stakeholder at all the level, at all levels of this of this effort. Uh, the second thing I think this is most where the, where the progress has been done, and in some way, thanks to the research money that uh, Professor. Uh, Ahmed is spending on the faculty, innovation and technology. I think there is, you have to admit that there was amazing things that have happened in the space of autonomous driving and this, you know, uh, new uh, technology about cars and 
vehicular technology in general. Um, the question is, are these innovations centered toward the human needs and addresses the human aspirations when it comes to this, to this technology? And finally, which we do always, I mean, the, the IT people, computer science and the designer in general, unfortunately, they, they leave the regulat regulatory issues to the last time. And that's a big, big problem because if it's not done from the inception of your design, if it's done as an afterthought, you run into problems. And the best example for that is the Internet. And then when the Internet was designed, the people who put together the Internet are geniuses in many, many ways. But they didn't tackle difficult questions, one of them security, mobility, but more importantly, the legal aspect. And that stuff has been added to the Internet and we're still struggling. I would say Internet is 50% successful because you can get 50% good stuff, but you also have to cope with 50% of the stuff that is not equally as, as good. So, uh, so this workshop hopefully will, 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 will build on current understanding and the recent development and will explore the three dimensions. As I said, the goal here is just not to meet and greet each other and go away. I'm looking forward to hearing all this, your, your, your opinions and your contribution to this workshop because the intention is to publish something that recognizes this event but also says what, uh, what are the most important um, issues that need to be addressed in order for that to make, uh, to make it available. And I will give uh, a chance for, do, do you have a microphone? Should I give you? I okay. have a Good. Here. So, the Mattis, the floor is yeah. yours. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we, we have decided we do this a little bit. You have to turn off the mic. Uh, okay. Uh, we do this a little bit in a ping pong style. So, we, we, ha we have organized this event together, and I'm really very happy that uh, we, we, we have this collaboration and hopefully long term uh, collaboration. Um, <coughs> We will get to these questions. Let me just briefly say a few words of introduction as well. Um, I'm a professor at EP, actually, I'm a professor emeritus uh, at the EPFL, Ecole uh, Polytechnique. We have a campus here in Ras al Um But uh, uh, EPFL is mainly an engineering university. Uh, however, I was fortunate to to lead uh, the College of Management of Technology, Policy and Technology, uh, Management of Technology uh, as a political scientist <laughs> in the enge engineering environment. So we really do this um, link between, as what Professor Zanati just said, you know, the governance of the technology and, <laughs> and the technology itself. And somehow they, there needs to be a certain coherence between the two in order for uh, technology to really be successful. So we believe in technology. We believe that uh, all these new things, you, you mentioned uh, autonomous driving, the digitalization more generally. We, we really believe that this has a huge potential uh, to improve mobility for the citizens, for the governments that can better organize. But we also are aware that all this technology needs to be governed <laughs> in order to ultimately be successful, which means regulations, policies, and things like that. So uh, I'm also here in my capacity of uh, IGLUS. You will see the, the logo there. Innovative governance of large urban systems. Uh, Umut is uh, the manager of the IGLUS program. And this is uh, really the the context, as I say, we, 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 we focus on the urban systems and then try to integrate technology into the governance of the large urban systems, which, where the real challenges are, as you just la la laid out, the mobility challenges, the pollution challenges. So from my side, I think that's, thank you again for doing this together. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to work with you. There was uh, a lot of preparation went in, so before we start, actually, I would like to thank everybody who's here who contributed, in, including the producer, by the way, <laughs> who contributed to making this event very, very successful, because I don't think it's easy to do this, especially for different places and different countries talking and trying to get everybody to think the same way and then agree on what needs to be done. So um, uh, the, 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 the structure of the session, we're going to have keynote speaker. Uh, who would be presenting, I mean, sharing your thoughts, his, his thoughts with you, okay? Then they're going to have a panel, 
and this panel will focus on these issues. And I hope that we, 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 you will find that there are different aspects and concepts that will be introduced, and some of them may be controversial, as a matter of fact. But the panel will pave the way for, toward the end for this fireside chat. You know, <coughs> panels are usually have moderators, and moderators sometimes they get enamored with themselves, and then they start talking and stop the panelists from talking. So our chat here will do the opposite. The panelists will be actually everybody in the panel. And then we're going to hopefully focus on what emerges out of that panel. Then uh, we follow up with, uh, with, uh, with another keynote speech. Uh, the, at the end of the day, as I said, we do the fireside channel, but the intention here is to gather all these thoughts and then start developing this document that I hope will provide some useful, useful insights into this really extremely important. As I said, the United Nations has been touting this, and it has so many impacts, but 13 or 14 SDGs have been identified to be directly impacted by, by mass. Anyway, okay? So uh, I think... With yeah, that. I, I, I just wanted to add a few things. So, sure. that uh, I mean, we are a very small group here. Uh, we want to have an open discussion like we usually do. Uh, but uh, we are streaming this live, so we will not only be streaming, but we'll make a short YouTube out of it that can be, it can be used. Uh, we, we, we will produce a policy brief which, which draws on the main lessons that, uh, and that's a document that will be available for, for everybody. And, you know, we, we, we will consider uh, future publications and for us it's just the first step for our joint Lots. collaboration between EPFL yes. and UAE. Okay, and we're counting on that. Excuse me. So yes. the viewers can ask questions via YouTube. Sorry? Viewers who are on YouTube, yeah. they can ask questions directly in the chat, and this will be responded to. Because it's live streaming. Yes. Uh, I so if they have questions, they can write. Okay, but somebody has to check. That. I, I can yes, okay. d d Dr. Manzuru. I will okay. do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Good. Please. Okay. So uh, uh, the first one is the panel discussion. Um, no. Uh, no. The first one is. So the first one would be the professor. Uh, ah, okay. Professor Alahi. Alahi. So I can just and then you will introduce him. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, professor. So thank you. So Maybe thanks you a lot. To introduce uh, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so very much uh, for a very nice welcome and setting the stage, uh, both uh, Professor Thayyip uh, uh, Zanati and Professor Matthias. So um, as you know from uh, the welcome, uh, the structure is quite clear. So our first keynote speaker would be, uh, oh, by the way, my name is Manzur Khan. I'm assistant professor at uh, CIT uh, uh, UAE University. Okay, let me go there. As Ms. Don't ask me. I guess it should be for the production then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, That's what I said. Uh, my name is Manzur Khan. I'm with CIT, College of IT, UAE University. Uh, uh, so, as the structure uh, was uh, very clear uh, from the welcome and setting the stage session, our first speaker would be online. Uh, he may already be joining online on the Zoom. Uh, so he is uh, Assistant Professor uh, Alexander Lahi uh, with EPFL. Uh, he worked as a postdoc uh, in Stanford for uh, five years uh, and has a PhD from EPFL. Uh, his research focus is on uh, transportation in smart environment. So Professor Elahi, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. I don't see you, but I, feel I hope you see me. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, great. And so let's also um, share my slides. Uh, what do you see? Perfect. You see slides? Yes. Fantastic. Um, so I don't know if it's intentional, but we don't have any visual on you guys. So I don't know if there's a camera that should be turned on for the House of Switzerland, or, or I don't know. Um, 
Okay, okay. So that's intentional. Good. <laughs> Um, uh, well, thank you for the uh, invitation. It's a it's a great honor. I'm I'm actually extremely sad that I could not be physically there. Um, I hope that there will be other opportunities to uh, to meet each other. I uh, I um, I thought that I'm gonna start with uh, with a video uh, that I uh, find online, which I, I thought was very funny. It's about three minutes. Uh, I hope that you will um, be able to see it and hear it well. Uh, let me play it. She used to have a lot of CDs. Now, she has this She also used to have loads of videotapes and DVDs. But now, she has this. She also had a car that she only used for special occasions and sometimes in her work. But now, she has this instead and this. This is Lucas and his daughters. Lucas could not afford to have a car which was rather inconvenient sometimes. Now that he has this, they can do this. And it's much smoother to do things like this. This is the last plan. They used to have two cars to clean and service and look after. And on top of that, finding parking places near the office every day. But now they have this instead. And they've also got this to look after. So that is this. Well, this is a new service that gives you access to all available means of transportation. In one single app and with just one bill. Take Lucas, for example. He usually takes the bus to work. But once a week, he plays tennis with some old friends. Then he uses a bike between work and the sports arena. Laura is a dedicated biker. She loves to exercise before work, but in winter, she prefers the comfort of the train. Sometimes when she visits clients, she needs to use a car. Then the travel costs can easily be split between private and work-related journeys. And at the last one's residence, there are no more nightly calls when Lisa misses the last bus. She can easily get a taxi. Use buses, trams, ferries, trains, and shared bikes or shared cars, and taxi. Combine different ways of traveling. Let the app suggest route and means of transportation, and even sync it with your calendar. You will reduce your costs for traveling. You will be a lot more flexible. And at the same time, you are doing something good for the city and for the environment. Voilà. This is, uh, this is about uh, mobility as, as a service. Um, I, would, I would have not been able to describe it better. So I hope uh, you were able to uh, hear uh, the video and, and see it. Um, I, um, I want to share this definition, uh, one of the definitions uh, for mobility as a service, integration of various forms of transportation services into a single one, accessible on demand. And uh, basically, uh, you can have multiple players, you can have multiple platforms that will decide to fuse, combine multiple sources of uh, mobilities, modes, um, sometimes they will uh, talk to each other, sometimes they will not, and, and <coughs> one of the challenge uh, is indeed to, to be able to communicate, chain information, uh, have, uh, for instance, open <laughs> API about billing and about transactions so that many uh, companies uh, or service provider could merge their service uh, together and work together. Um, perhaps, uh, and this is also the, the goal of, of this talk, the most exciting uh, service uh, for me as an AI uh, professor is um, um, the use of autonomous uh, vehicle. Um, uh, how will autonomous vehicle uh, impact um, this type of 
services? Uh, will it even uh, improve their usage, um, their quality, um, and are we there yet? Uh, is it going to happen? So why uh, autonomous uh, vehicle uh, would have an impact? Mm, because if we look at the all-in cost per mile of vehicle services, we can uh, do the math and we see that uh, as soon as uh, a car can be autonomous, its cost will um, reduce. Um, and this is basically some uh, study from uh, almost five years ago now. Um, but um, and these numbers are quite attractive. Uh, so if we are able to um, enable autonomous vehicle, um, then we will be able to offer uh, services that are extremely cost effective. Another uh, nice opportunity when um, you provide uh, a service that is potentially controlled by a machine or by a computer, um, you have room for optimization. You have room to um, search multiple solutions, uh, solve an optimization problem, um, and maximize your objectives or minimize your um, uh, loss functions, um, and therefore uh, you can come up with solutions that are, for instance, extremely suited for um, carbon emission, um, whereas for us humans it would have been very difficult to come up with this solution without having access to the global information, all the information, all the options, uh, and calculating the uh, cost. Yes? Okay, <laughs> I heard someone. You're with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and and uh, and so, one of the fun, there's two things that really excite me about uh, mobility as a service. One is that regardless of autonomous vehicle, if I have access to many uh, service provider and I can uh, compute costs of uh, travel. Uh, it can be cost uh, with respect to time, with respect to emissions, with respect to speed, with respect to um, you know uh, uh, beauty of the of the of the path. Um, uh, then the machine can um, select the most optimal option for my desire, uh, for my personal desire, and and I think uh, this is um, basic thanks to the digitalization of the service. And the second one is, um, well, uh, if it's autonomous, uh, it's uh, cheaper, and potentially even the service will be even better. Now, um, the, in the rest of this uh, talk, I want to um, share my point of view on are we there or not? Do we have the AI uh, to enable uh, autonomous uh, mobility uh, as a service? About uh, now six uh, years ago, um, yeah, AI started to to be everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. Um, it was uh, definitely uh, a booming uh, moment, um, and uh, companies, uh, policymakers, governments, all acknowledged that AI will affect all segments of our society, and the EU put mobility at a crossroads. This is Switzerland uh, uh, now, and this is the future envisioned by uh, AI. A future where autonomous vehicles, such as self-driving cars, delivery robots, will reshape our last mile uh, mobility which is how we move humans and goods to their final destination. So why is it technically uh, fascinating? Uh, because we need to develop an AI um, that must learn to interact with us, humans powered with free will, coexist in safe, safe yet efficient uh, manner. The question is, uh, are we there? So back then, a lot of people were saying that, yes, autonomous vehicle will, will happen. It's already happening. We uh, have the technology. You will see in 2021, uh, it will be there. Uh, and 
Let me share with you some concrete example of um, uh, what's happening. Here is uh, our autonomous vehicle operating in a residential, resi res residential area um, well known from the autonomous vehicle. And um, at time t, it's in autonomous mode. It works very well. Um, and you can see that on the right, there is uh, a pedestrian um, that looked at the car, looked at other cars, and suddenly decided to cross path, um, not on the um, crosswalk area. The autonomous vehicle was not able to predict this type of behavior, and the human controlling and monitoring the system had to take over, had to take an intervention to prevent collision. So uh, the, why this happened? Let me give you a very uh, uh, crash course on the AI of autonomous vehicle. Uh, it's commonly based on two pillars. The first pillar is in charge of detecting objects of understanding the current state of the world. Uh, for instance, we can detect this vehicle, the traffic light, the drivable area in green, and even the crosswalk. Where is the crosswalk? Now, given this perception, this perceived world, uh, we have another pillar, the planning, that is in charge of selecting the most suited trajectory path, given what we perceive. And indeed, uh, and the problem is um, it's missing a forecasting pillar. We, the AI needs to predict that regardless of, of the current state, I see uh, that, for instance, I have a very beautiful drivable area. I know that in the next second, this pedestrian on the side will decide to cross path and uh, I'll need to rethink uh, my planning based on my capability to predict the future. Hence, uh, if I have this forecasting pillar, I can better uh, plan a decision. And this is uh, not happening. We struggle in the AI system of an autonomous vehicle to develop this forecasting pillar. To, to be able to do as good as humans in anticipating the future, in anticipating what will happen, and understanding even human free will. Um, we are not able to perfectly pre predict the world, but good enough to make safe yet efficient decisions. Now I can play the devil advocate. You can tell me that, look, if you see such a pedestrian, you can code a rule that, uh, well, slow down uh, and let the pedestrian uh, cross path. And uh, I will show you that there are many scenarios where such policy is not uh, possible. In fact, 98% of autonomous vehicle accidents nowadays are due to an unexpected stop because of high density crowd, because of seeing someone around the car that could potentially uh, is too close or will cross path. In cities where traffic is dense, where bicycles are nearby vehicles, where traffic participants behave based on social norms and not based on only the driving book, such as my hometown in, in Paris, autonomous vehicle unexpectedly stop making other driver crash into them. So what's missing? It's not a perception nor planning problem. I claim that AI cannot yet predict the future to effectively interact. What does predicting the future mean? Uh, it's predict predicting interaction, agent-agent interactions. For me, an agent is referred to as other drivers other bicycles, other pedestrians, animals, any uh, moving entity. And I like to, to refer to this as a social forecasting uh, task. Now let me introduce you another autonomous vehicle, uh, much smaller, 
uh, but still very useful. Our little robot moving uh, alongside pedestrian in Lausanne. Its application can be delivery. You can still move goods with this uh, 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 robot. It can assist humans in their mobility. Um, and I argue that if we have the AI to enable our autonomous vehicle move uh, in this environment, then we have the AI to move any autonomous vehicle. Why? Because it's a, a harder task than self-driving cars with respect to anticipating the future. The environment is not as structured as the highway and the roads. And the dynamic of pedestrian has much more non-linearity than vehicles. And again, if we apply the AI to this system, we see that when the too much crowd, the robot freezes in close proximity and does not even comply with a uh, social norm. Here is an example of our robot. The perception pillar will detect this pedestrian. The planning pillar will say, okay, I detect three possible paths that are physically possible. I'm going to take the shortest one. Yet, AI must understand that it's socially not accepted to navigate between these two people uh, talking to each other. And it must forecast the behavior of the left person to not cross path. And take uh, the right uh, uh, path. And the social forecasting pillar must address that, must uh, address this uh, challenge. If um, you combine all these uh, pillars, the perception, planning with a social forecasting pillar, it will pave the way to a new type of cognition I like to refer to as socially aware AI. An AI that is able to understand human-human interactions or any agent-agent um, interaction. If AI uh, and autonomous vehicle are powered with such intelligence, they will have the capability to imitate us provide a sense of familiarity. And then the system will blend in and naturally interact with us in safe yet efficient manner. Now, uh, is this uh, good enough? Are we, again, if we are able to develop socially aware AI, are we going to have autonomous vehicle? Or let me ask another question. Is the system or the AI trustworthy? Researchers, uh, uh, to solve this problem, have commonly pursued system performance. Uh, they usually try to maximize accuracy as the main and sometimes only metric in the workflow. But because of the consequences of a mistake and of the um, sensitivity of the task, and such metric is not good enough. We cannot suppose that if I have good accuracy, then I can trust uh, the system. We must look at other um, concepts like robustness. Is my system robust to any situation, to any environment, to any corner cases? And in fact, we are currently uh, researching on new ways to be able to evaluate autonomous vehicle without necessarily putting the vehicle into um, the physical space and testing for its performance. We are thinking of are there ways that if we have access to the AI, to the algorithms, can we test them in a way that we can say, look, your AI is failing in this situation, which is very possible in this environment, in this city. And in fact, we already have preliminary results showing that if we are able to find, to generate the input artificially in a way that we can check if the algorithm succeed, then we can um, solve this uh, requirement for an evaluation. And we can do this, thing, this type of feedback saying that, okay, you gave us your AI of autonomous vehicle, we checked it, and uh, we identify a scenario, a use case, where you will fail. And this is an illustration of it. Um, your, your car is at this intersection, and its AI is predicting that it's okay to go straight, uh, which will lead to an uh, off-road and potentially uh, collision. Uh, 
Um, so you need to go back and still address this issue. We also need to have an AI that is responsible. What responsible means, it means many things, but one of the um, current challenge uh, is can the AI explain its de and decision? Explainability in AI. Can the output uh, be interpretable in a way that we share rationals about the decision uh, making process? The other um, uh, challenge which is also related to uh, responsible is ethical. Um, is our AI ethical, ethically aware? Um, and I uh, give uh, talks and lectures and I like to, to, to show you this experiment uh, um, which is I show you this scenario, we don't talk, uh, right away I ask you to vote. Uh, if you have a computers and you want to run the experiment, uh, please uh, connect to uh, this website, webspeakup.info, the room is the following, and you can just select A and B. What do you think the AI should do? And again, for simplicity, there are no other options. There will, always, there will be a collision because of the physics of the constraint of the road. Uh, the question is, should the collision happen with these two people in A and lead to uh, death or with uh, the person uh, in B and again lead uh, to death? Let me see if there are people uh, voting. Uh, no, zero. <laughs> so either you don't hear me or you're really not motivated to try. Uh, um, I'm going to wait maybe 10 seconds to see if there is one connection. Sorry? Uh, unfortunately, I don't hear you very well, but okay. Let me, uh, let me continue. Usually, um, um, the answer to this is about uh, 60 to 30 percent uh, um, for one, I mean, I mean, I mean between these two uh, uh, options. So 60 percent for A and 40 percent uh, for B. So we don't have uh, a universal uh, ethic. Um, and even in a crowd that is very, very uh, educated uh, and potentially uh, from the same uh, culture. We brainstorm, usually. Uh, oh, I see three people uh, voting. Okay, so it's 67% uh, for A and 30% for uh, B. Um, okay, at least you can hear me. Good sign. <laughs> so. Um, then we, we bra brainstorm uh, why uh, we think it should be A, why we think it should be B, and we share um, use cases of the implication of implementing each of these uh, policy. And people uh, try uh, start to uh, converge. Um, and one argument against B is if I know that um, my... Uh, AI system will always minimize the number of humans. All I have to do uh, is to be with a friend, cross uh, the road at any time, and I know that it will AI will move and will crash into another person walking alone. So I will always be safe. So this is almost an adversarial uh, uh, solution where if we implement the minimized uh, only quantity, uh, this can be used in a wrong way and potentially in an uh, unfair uh, manner. So when we, I share these, uh, these uh, uh, comments uh, and others' uh, motivation, then indeed the crowd uh, we vote. Uh, you can, let's, uh, let's see if you guys are still there. Uh, I'm going to open uh, another one, uh, close the previous one, and I'm going to ask you for the four people that connected to the system to vote again uh, to see if they want to preserve their uh, original decision. And you will... Oh, I'm monitoring, and I'm still going to continue <laughs> the talk. Um, and usually, uh, we have a change of uh, 80 to 20%. 
Um, but we still have 20% that regardless of what you tell them, uh, uh, it's a sensitive uh, emotional decision. They don't want to uh, change their decision. Um, and uh, now the question is, okay, um, so uh, how should we implement these uh, ethical rules? Should the government make a hard decision, policy makers, institution, car manufacturers, someone, some entity can say, okay, this is the, uh, the rules, uh, you accept it or not, it's up to you. Uh, or can we have a system that when you enter uh, the autonomous vehicle, you can share your own ethics, you can share what you want the, the car to do in these situations. So you're, 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 it would have been the same way as you're driving and what type of decision you would have made. So this seems to be quite uh, appealing because we still potentially uh, um, are able to reproduce your AI, your ethic, and not someone else's ethic. And you you could put uh, and even claim that you'll be responsible for the decisions because you have communicated what well, how you want the robot to behave. And uh, now, so this is fantastic. But now let's go back to our uh, motivation of using uh, uh, mobility as a service. So what if you have your autonomous vehicle that is coming, you want to, to use it, and it's a shared uh, vehicle with other users? Um, how will you agree on what should be the ethics implemented in the autonomous vehicle in these uh, scenarios? And, and, and now or we, we need to think about that, but surprisingly, uh, when we use these existing uh, human driver uh, solutions, we, we don't necessarily worry about their ethics um, because we think that anyway they will be responsible. Uh, but um, here, um, this is also an open question. How sh we should we implement um, ethics of uh, mobility as a service, um, uh, especially if everything becomes um, autonomous. I want to uh, uh, end with one final concept of acceptance. Uh, will um, users accept this technology, this AI, this autonomous vehicle, given all the things that I just told you and all the challenges that we have? And uh, I like to, to share this analogy um, that uh, very likely you guys know, but the, the young generation uh, does not, which is uh, we currently have autonomous elevators. Uh, we call them elevator, but they are in fact autonomous. They used to be operated by humans, by drivers uh, of elevators. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the technology uh, became uh, available, possible uh, in the in the early and uh, 19s, um, uh, nobody would have uh, wanted to, to use it. No, nobody trusts the technology, and it's only because of a strike of the elevator operators that at one point people uh, had to use it because there were um, no other options, and they started to develop trust. So. Um, uh, acceptance for me is not necessarily uh, a, a challenge or an issue given uh, our past history of uh, uh, humanity using a new um, technology. I will uh, finish here. I hope that I'm respecting timing. Uh, and so for me, um, one of the most exciting uh, opportunity with mass is to combine it with autonomous uh, vehicle, um, but then the autonomous vehicle needs to be socially and ethically aware uh, uh, and with a responsible AI um, to operate it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor uh, Elahi. Uh, I would open the floor for two questions, if there are any questions. Uh, from to the hall or online questions? Yes. Okay. So whoever talked, I, I could hear that person very well. 
uh, what I said is uh, thanks a lot. But not the rest of the people. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot for a very interesting talk, Professor Elahi. Uh, I'm opening the floor for two questions, Max. Uh, so if there is any questions, uh, we'll entertain that question, please. Yes. Yeah. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. This is a very interesting uh, talk, especially when you, um, when you bring in the um, ethically aware uh, uh, behavior or uh, decisions that needs to, uh, to be computed. So the question is, uh, based on your experience and your expectation of what is ethically aware, do you think it is uh, computationally feasible to make ethical decisions, wrong or right, and, or uh, make a decision about whether you go for A or, or B? Um, that's a very interesting uh, uh, um, comment. I, this is my intuition. I, in the beauty with ethic, and maybe I don't know if you want to go to morality or not, but is uh, we have tried to teach it uh, to our kids, to our humanity. So we have potentially simple rules like respecting uh, others, a simple rule, um, uh, or simple hierarchy. S um, in some culture, um, the ethics tells you that a human has more rights than an animal, and uh, an animal has more rights than a vegetable. Uh, or vegetarian or uh, a rock um, and uh, um, and these are simple rules um, then their manifestation of uh, all the scenarios are quite complex but if you are able to disentangle the key concept behind the ethics which maybe are not that many you will be able to yes. implement the decision-making process. And uh, for me, this is true for many compute, I mean, uh, uh, signal reconstruction tasks. I think our world uh, looks very complex. Our decisions, maybe our navigation looks complex. But the causality, uh, the atoms that are generating what we see I claim there are uh, very few numbers of atoms that are needed to generate what we see, um, and it's a matter of learning to combine them in m many uh, ways. But if you are able to understand these uh, few atomic representation of your world, um, you would be able to uh, show that it's computational quite uh, feasible to then make decisions ba based on that. Thanks a lot. Uh, Professor Matthias, I guess you had a question? Yeah, yes, Alexandre. Um, uh, I, you know, I'm, my, my field is really regulation. And uh, we are now talking about uh, the reg AI regulation. The EU Commission is preparing an AI regulation act. Uh, my question to you, isn't that a little bit premature in light of what you say? Are we putting the cart in front of the ox? So, um, um, so is your question, is it uh, immature, I mean, is it too soon to, to, to no, suppose I that we will, we will be able to have autonomous vehicle? Uh, I mean, we're Around trying us? to regulate something that you are showing us we are not even technically re ready to, to, to implement. So we're making rules for things that, and probably we're going to shape the technological development by making the rules without having waited for what is technologically possible. Um, um, the, I... I First, I think that uh, uh, we should do it at any time, so why wait? Okay. Uh, I, I, I really believe that this is going to happen. Uh, there's so much uh, human effort, uh, resources allocated to solving this that um, it's happening. Now, 
uh, instead of waiting to make sure when the technology is ready and think of the regulation, why not do them jointly? Okay. Why not do them in parallel? And, and the regulation, um, uh, sometimes it's not uh, that different from the past. I mean, uh, our society has witnessed a lot of new technology uh, that were scary uh, for that time. But then they were able to, to come up with standards uh, and, and quality control uh, to make them happen. And, and uh, here it's just a matter that uh, to be willing to, to allocate some time to um, define them and, and, uh, and move forward. Okay. So actually, Thank I want to push back a little bit on you <coughs> because I want to make things controversial. Uh, people would say that AI, there is no bad AI. There is bad no human, there is no bad AI and good AI. There is only bad human or good human. Actually, to go back to your example, the reason we are debating this is because a passenger decided to violate the rules and then decided to cross the street instead of walking on the sidewalk, he just did the wrong thing. So there is no bad AI or good AI because AI is just a tool, so to speak. And furthermore, people say then really what you, what you have to deal with is the same thing we deal with in every single day. People drive drunk and they hit people and the people die. As a matter of fact, Uber, first accident of Uber that happened in the United States was caused by the, the, the driver who was supposed to be sitting in that car was streaming a video and watching that video, that's what that happened. So it's really the AI, would you say that the AI failed in this case or the person failed? I think the lawyer said uh, the AI did not fail, the car did not, Uber cannot be sued. It is the, pa the driver that's sitting there that committed the mistake and the driver is going to jail right now. So do you agree that there is no bad AI and good AI, but there is bad human and good human? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, um, what defines good and bad <coughs> is related to um, free will. So, um, so <coughs> if a system, uh, if someone has free will, then it has uh, the opportunity to make any decisions based on their impact. Uh, and I uh, claim that um, AI system or any machine or robot uh, will not have free will. Um, they will be able to um, show us that they can uh, make decisions uh, out of many options and the options can vary, but this has been coded. This has been uh, uh, implemented, um, they are not uh, trying to uh, reason based on their um, any free will or and ends. As you said, there are tools, um, and as anything else is a tool, and anything can be used with free will in a bad or a good way, um, and and we need to indeed make sure that human free will um, is being used. Um, uh, and, and, and that we humans are not forgetting, uh, basically, the ethics uh, of uh, what, what thing, anything we do. Thanks I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. Thank you so very much once again uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, just to highlight here, uh, on a very similar topic of autonomous driving uh, at UAU, thanks a lot to the Emirates uh, uh, center of uh, Mobility Research and the Research Center, that they are really putting a lot of efforts and budget uh, for these activities. Thanks a lot for that. So uh, now we are moving towards uh, the panel discussion. Uh, uh, as the topic, uh, mobility as a service is really positioned uh, or poised to be a game changer uh, of industry, paving the path uh, for transportation revolution. Uh, now the question is, are we there yet? It was also mentioned by the speaker uh, and in a very detail. So in this panel discussion, the experts uh, will analyze the current trends, uh, tested ideas, best practices, and transformative approaches uh, to shed the light on the future 
of transportation. Um, so there are uh, panelists. Uh, our first panelist is Professor uh, Tayyip Zanati. Uh, he is a professor. Uh, uh, he is the dean of College of IT at UAE University. Uh, prior to this, he was the professor and chair of Department of Computer Science at University of Pittsburgh. Um, during his service at the university, he was selected as the director of computer and network system division at the National Science Foundation. He also led uh, National Science Foundation IT research initiative, uh, a multi-billion research program. So, uh, Professor Zanati, the floor is yours. Yeah, the slide will be. We're going to do it. Uh, thank you. So I will be uh, very short, but I'm going to I'm going to uh, raise a, a number of questions uh, here. Um, so you can see here there are two definitions of mass, and I picked those among many many other ones that have been uh, 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 published or or proposed in, in different reports. Some, some some of them are strategic documents. Some of them are actually research papers as well. Uh, mass is a seamless integration of various forms of transportation and transport-oriented services into comprehensive single and on-demand mobile services, mobility service. So you can see that the focus here is really on the user. It's a user-centric view of what uh, mass is supposed to be. And it's uh, driven by an intelligent mobility system. So AI comes in here again as an, a, a critical component of this. And the whole thing is the distribution model is going to be a mobility service provider that offers aggregated service to the, to, the, to the users. And the users can determine what's good for them. And then at the end, they will get the service that they need. Okay. But there is another definition which uses digital interface and shared data so this shared data is extremely important because shared means that people should collaborate to achieve the common task, which is mass. The stakeholders should be able to share their data in order for them to come together and provide these comprehensive solutions. Okay? And the purpose here is to manage the provision of a transport-oriented services that meet the mobility requirement of people. So this is, again, a system-centric approach that engages all the stakeholders to take action and be able to support that vision of mass. Okay? A little bit of context. I said this in my opening uh, uh, remarks. Relevant of transport to the UN SDGs. Everybody is familiar with UN SDGs, right? UN developed these documents and then they looked what to, you know, all the, the challenges that the world actually faces. And then they set agenda, which articulated by many workshops and all that stuff, to see what would be something that we can do so all human can live a decent life. And you can see that the transportation really weighs heavily on their programming and then our strategy to be able to allow for the sustainability. Okay? So it's about eight of the 17 sustainable development goals of SDGs are driven or influenced or impacted by the mobility. And, okay? and then many of them make either direct or indirect uh, 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 impact to this here. So there is also research that has been done by people who voluntarily, so when you say voluntarily, so you have to trust that they are not lying in a way. 
because they're giving this like voluntarily, and they reference the the, the number of uh, vir virtual national review uh, voluntary national reviews. Uh, reference so many things in there. Social equi uh, equ equity is an extremely important thing. There are people who actually cannot. I mean, even the United States. I remember when I was funding some research in the United States, w I discovered that some of the Indians, the, uh, the true Indians, the American Indians, some of the kids have to work in the weekend. They have to walk about 10 to, to, to 15 kilometers, about five or six miles, in order for them to get to the library, for them to be able to do their homework and have access to that. So it's not only the poor country, it's really it's in some places in the world, okay? Um, there is uh, the, the regional conductivity, the road sa uh, safety, the urban access, and so on and so forth. And all of these things here mention mass as one possible solution to alleviate or at least to mitigate the negative impact with that. There's a lot of benefits for mass, and I'm not going to go through the, through the details of them, okay? But in essence, what we're supposed to deliver is this type of service, support for public transit services. So you cannot possibly, at least not in the foreseeable future, not going to ignore the classic mobility options that we have. And all of a sudden, people are going to give their cars and then start driving or sharing rides or sharing bikes and so on and so forth. I see the mass as an additional option for people to do so. For example, in California, I can assure you that if people have means to do this, okay, even though they have their own cars, but if they're going to be stuck in a congested highway for hours in order for them to go work, and they have means to do this in a more efficient way, because there's some sort of a brain that will direct the transportation system and offer different possibility and have people aggregate their needs in order for them to share these devices, I think that would be very appealing. So the, this does not necessarily say you're going to lose your private car. No, you're going to opportunistically use whatever is available to you in that context in order for you to achieve whatever goal you would like to achieve, okay? And support for shared mobility service, I list many of them, including walking, by the way. And safety, uh, safety uh, walking safely, it could become an issue, uh, especially for female uh, people. So uh, resilient transport systems, if, if mass is achieved, it's going to be resilient for the reason I, I share here. Um, uh, there, if there is disruption because you have multiple options, you can actually pick a different options. Whereas if there's disruption in the highway, everything stops. If an accident can stop everything, and all of a sudden you see congestion developing everywhere because it's not very well uh, coordinated and orchestrated. You can also provide real-time system information. Real-time is the operative word here. And there are a lot of, like, um, I know that uh, people in Japan and some in northern, uh, northern Europe and so on and so forth, they're developing communication system that will guarantee continued communication in highway and interaction with the highway as if like the highway and the cars are integrated into one ecosystem and get all the things that you need to do. And then assist authorities to optimize the resources as well. Um, I was in Singapore and I think at some point before you get downtown you have to pay a higher rate than actually if you were to stop and then park your car somewhere else because it became unlivable. You cannot really circulate and do anything because they are a small country and then the number of people is increasing and the possibility of owning a car is becoming also something very affordable, okay? Sustainable transport systems go beyond personally owned cars and then have something that can last and can help people be where they're supposed to be in an easy way. Uh, personalized, human-centric, this is another thing. And finally, the ubiquity and inclusiveness. Lots of people cannot afford to buy cars. And if they have to travel, they have to be packed. And if you don't believe me, go to D.C. and try to get in a metro. You have to be <laughs> banging, you know, to get to shove yourself in, especially if you go during, you know, office hours. So... Uh, there is also the stakeholders. That's a little bit of a context here. And the stakeholders, you can see here, there are people that we forget. Thank God for Mattis today. He's going to defend these regulatory people. But you have the autonomous operators, the mobile, serv mobile service providers. We have security issue as well. I mean, if you can unleash this, this, this autonomous system out there, you're going to have to worry about that. You have the, the smart city and the impact of autonomous system in the smart cities. 
There must be also an integration, and I hope when the smart cities are going to be developed that some of the thinking goes about how do we include and embed, um, embed uh, autonomous driver, uh, dr driverless cars in there. And then the, the manufacturing and the tow component. People are manufacturing these gadgets at will every day. I mean, uh, Jitex, I've seen some cars. I thought I was like, uh, you know, super, some planet out there. You, know, you look at the car that was made. Uh, so uh, the, in order to understand what's at stake, now we can look at this here. You can look at the journey of, of, uh, of a customer. So they're going to be planning that involves the operator review, the data sharing, and all the other information, the other services that are needed. And after that, there is the purchase. And you have to pay, or you have to do a contract of some sort, and so on and so forth. So that's another way of interacting with the system. The third one is the prior to journey thing. And that's the navigation, the geodata um, uh, uh, traffic or advertising, and in some cases, the entertainment that you would like to be able to see while you're driving. And then you have, during the journey itself, you do what has been referred to many years ago as infotainment. That was like a, a huge buzzword about 10 years ago, and everybody wants to do. And that's really what I said, the integration of the internet, the highway, and the cars in one single unit, where people, where your kids can be watching two different movies, and you can drive you know, safely in the highway without having them bother you. And then the post-processing. What happened now if I requested the service on demand in real time? How do we deal with that? These components have to be there. For now, these components are provided by different people. And that is my, my concern. So in essence, if you look at the mass main components, you have the ticket and payment. You have the mobility package where prepayment package and time or distance-based type of cost that has to be looked at. You have incentives in order for people to buy in. Because when you create a technology, the first thing they have to worry about, and so many great technologies have died because they were thought without the user or the consumer needs in the, in, in the mind, okay? So, uh, and then the mobility service, when they are combined, and then if you have different providers, how would you do that? Access to the service information. What application? Is it going to be an online interface? What type of things that will give you this? And how can you make it available and accessible and easy to use to everyone and not only those savvy who use the Internet? Because at the end of the day, inclusiveness and serving these people who are deprived is one of the biggest issues there. Okay? So uh, these components have a strong impact, and there's lots of studies that have been done on this here. They have strong impact of the user's adoption of this technology, and then the behavior and the mode of choice to do that. And the question is, can AI help in this domain? Okay? So because of these components, people actually came up with different levels of integration. The first level is no integration. Different people are doing different things. Competition is really wreaking havoc, and everybody wants to do things, build the better car, and they make prices, blah, blah, blah. So there's no integration, and that's going to be devastating. But recently, people start talking about integration. What does that really mean? Integration of information, because there are, again, multiple stakeholders and multiple customers are coming there. You should be able to share information about people. If you're going to provide the service, especially if you do it uh, real time, and if you're going to enable the authorities to be able to respond quickly to disruptions when disruption occurs. The next thing is booking and payment. I shall talk a little bit about that. And then the third le level of it is service offer integration. And here they have the bundling and subscription, how we handled it, and uh, all the things that we do when we when you get services and pay as you go type of models and all that stuff, and finally the social regulatory and environmental integration, which is kind of lacking right now, even though there is some effort uh, to reduce the you know the COT emission of cars and all that stuff, but there's a lot more to that. Okay, so what are the challenges here from my perspective? First thing, if you talk to different people, even within the driverless and the autonomous system uh, like uh, Toyota and all this manufacturing in Germany and France and everywhere else. And you ask them about what do you mean? And it can go from autonomous driving 
right? All the way up to everything I talked about packaged in some seamless integrated way, okay? So that really is, uh, kind of wreaks a bit of, 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 of uh, craziness, of a confusion of the, of the users because they don't understand what's being offered and why should I give up my car in order to get what, okay? And that what happens is also a possibility for interoperability between them because they are not really working together based on some common understanding. It doesn't have to be. So there's a difference between us understanding what mass is and how it's implemented. The implemented is going to be where the competition actually happens. If I'm smarter than you, I'm going to take this concept that we agree is the right one and I'm going to implement it in a more efficient way than you do. And that's how I'm going to win. And usually competition is good because it's really the survival of the fittest, so to speak, and that's good for the, for the customers. The second thing is lack of a strong argument for economic viability that doesn't exist right now. People say, oh, this is great. Why is it great? I believe personally that there is a strong argument to be, there is a high value proposition to be made there, but I haven't seen it yet. Mostly because people, again, are driven exclusively by creation of digital software and hardware and gadget and all that stuff, which is not bad. But there is no, there is no kind of tying into this. Almost like there is, just like the speaker who talked now, his focus was on autonomous system. And because he has a belief, rightly so, that autonomous system is a big component. But I think the next thing actually touched upon ethics and all that stuff toward the end, but it should be m done much, much better. Okay? So uh, uh, the current offering of mass leave a lot to be desired. If you look at what mass is here, really people say, okay, what's this a hype, right? Books, glamorous pictures, amazing cars, and I can see them in front of me. And at the end, I share a bike or a ride. Or so I have to go and then walk and then get the bike that is tied to some sort of a pole there and drive it and make sure that I return it on time and struggle how what card I'm going to use in order for me to pay and all that stuff. So you can see that the reality and the vision are a little bit far apart right now. And we need to do that to some extent. Okay? And more importantly, it obfuscates the potential and the enormous benefit of mass. Because people now, look, when I don't see things happening realistically, my trust erodes, goes away eventually, and then I give up. I don't think we got to there, but I think that's something we have to read. The second thing is a holistic first and last mile solutions. Again, we should not decouple these. Then I have something that will provide me for the beginning, but not, not toward the end. This requires strong partnership between the different stakeholders. As I said, that doesn't, is currently not doable. Okay? So we need a clearly defined comprehensive framework for standardization. And also, we, hopefully, it's not going to be a de facto standard, but it's going to be some standard that actually reflects the, the, the public uh, uh, interest as much. And the need for an open market driven collaboration. I mean, the market is centralized, hybrid of some sort, or, or actually moderated or aggregated, and then third one would be open market. And I think the, 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 it has been proven time and again that open markets is the best way for success. <coughs> Um, and the finally, this narrow portfolio of services that really are not seeing where, where digital stuff and AI and data science are going. If you look, some of the services, they, they seem trivial to me. They, 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 there is no effort to go beyond the trivial and to do that. So I hope that we can look at these challenges and we address them and then see how best, you know, what, what needs to happen for us to have an economically feasible human-centric, profitable mass of the future that would help address some of the concerns that the United Nat Nation has raised in those documents. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor. Thank you. So, thanks a lot, Professor. Um, Our next speaker is um, Mr. Manjunath. Um, so Mr. Manjunath is a computer system engineer. He worked in uh, Broadcom. Uh, he did his MBA from UK. And since then, uh, he has been the director of Fairtech India. So Mr. Manjunath, the floor is yours.
thank you so much for inviting us over here so yeah as the professor was talking about mass and then we had another professor talking about autonomous as a service so uh, i am here to bring you back to the current state so what we believe is public transportation as a service and why it is very important for us to provide this okay so uh, i mean just a brief like we all know about mass like one on the one end we have all the fancy features to plan choose and pay basically and on the other end we have multiple operators operating multiple things like in including public transport and in between uh, there is a consumer who basically wants to go from point 1 to uh, point a to point b right so while developing all these features uh, technology companies are developing based on their understanding of what and the and the, got the competence of what a technology can do while uh, on the other end we have public transport operators who are kind of away from technology and don't really understand technology so what we try to do is understand the wants and needs of a consumer so why basically he makes that decision to go from point a to point b is it for work is it for leisure is it for i mean generally to uh, shopping so this is very important to understand what his choices are going to be so based on his needs you can determine what choice he will make so at the end of the day there are only two cho three choices one you either use complete private transport or you use a shared transport and in between these two is a very important critical thing that's a public transport right and we need to solve we need to use technology to solve this ma major chunk of you know people who actually use public transport and this is a largest segment that today exists people who go to office day in and day out on a regular basis who use public transport while we are not really concentrating on that need and this gives us a, i mean this raises the question what are we trying to achieve with mass right congestion sustainability or provide multiple choices so uh and then today what we believe personally is public transport exists today no matter how broken it is and we want to solve that simple problem of uh, making users public transport journey as simple as possible and this all starts with ticketing right so what we try to do is connect between a public transport operator and a consumer and make public transport operators operators easy to sell their tickets and also consumers to easy to make a, a travel so all you have to do is open the app swipe in get in multiple modes of public transport and then at the end of the day your payment is done so making the, his journey seamless is the fundamental thing that we want to achieve while yeah other things which can lead to mass is understanding the users mobility pattern right right now we know public transport exists and people are using public transport and the first and last mile connectivity can vary but at the end of the day understanding this backbone of each city is important to how you going to design those first and last mile choices to consumers so unless we don't understand this critical backbone we can't design a better choice and that's what we are trying to help operators design you know the first and last mile choices so how do we do that while simplifying ticketing right so we use something called as a transport mode detection so i uh, right now we identify if a person is traveling by bus by metro or by car or is he taking a walk or is he taking an e scooter but we charge only to the public transport but this can actually lead to the first and last mile connectivity like right? if you identify you can charge them later and that's what fatic is you know trying to do with the basic of uh, the other uh, fundamental level of simplifying mo mobility and this is not all and uh, the whole process of you know traveling is is a chore at the end of the day we just want to reach the destination it's a chore so how do we make this chore even more interesting in terms of the, there were a lot of uh, sustainability goals that were been uh, talked about so will people be influenced if we if we showcase that you know his or her journey over the month has actually saved so much of co2 these small features which actually 
can be implemented and can show results on tomorrow and day after tomorrow is what leads to i mean uh, greater innovation and in the later so that's what we we are planning we are doing in terms of at uh, the first step at uh, the very fundamental simplifying ticketing and then gamifying the whole travel process right and while we do this the most important aspect since we are tar our target the uh, we are targeting the major chunk who are the daily office goers and daily uh, public transport users we need to incentivize them yeah it's good that you know i saved so much of co2 the month but at the end of the day how how much do i save financially because uh, these are the people for them money also matters so where public transport operators can incentivize directly to these uh, users that helps them to even improve i mean increase their uh, footfall at the end of the day so uh, yeah so it's all good but users everybody wants more and more and more and that's what we are trying to do is like how can we delight users uh, public transport users at the end of the day so we we offer uh, you know solutions like a corporate mobility solutions where corporates can pitch in to the whole effort of you know make uh, like uh, as simple as like mercedes benz which uh gives the public transport voucher credits in switzerland for everybody who buys uh, who buys a car so like you're pushing a private car owner to use public transport by giving him a credit so that makes them to come to use so we, we are what we are targeting is not only simplifying the daily public transport users but also getting in people who don't use public transport and why don't they use can gamification help can incentivizing help or can delighting them help so at the end of the day sorry yeah so uh, so these small things which actually the small features which actually don't appear to be great but actually impact a lot so it, it's always like it it's a human tendency right something that i don't expect and i get leaves a bad, ma major impact on me rather than something i expect and even if it meets my expectation somewhere i don't i'm not happy about it so th that's why we believe in delighting users so uh, while we cater to all the uh, users at the end of the day like we need public transport operators to actually provide service like we are a technology provider we can give you uh, give uh, ticketing as a service we can give multiple features but the public transport operators are the one who operate those buses who 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 need to you know service that so for them we provide enough tools for them to understand the customer needs and then this uh, decide what to do so this actually uh, you know uh, lays the foundation for what we're talking about mass of solving the first and last mile connectivity and this also helps the mass providers to actually place bikes or e scooters or shared cars any other strategic location so everybody is benefited from this so yeah once again thank you so much and so much for the interesting talk so our next speaker is uh, Cassius Castellino uh, he is with uh, Swissnex India he is a public and urban transportation specialist uh, he has worked with the world resource institute of india world bank uh, india and a gateway house so cassius castellino would be online uh, i guess he is already there so the floor is yours uh, Thank you very much for that uh, introduction and uh, a very good morning good afternoon and good evening to everyone who is joining us today from all around the world uh, i wish that i could be there physically but i'm sure there will be other opportunities presenting themselves and we can meet in person uh, about myself i'm cashis castellino and i'm the program manager and energy and urban transport specialist for the university partnerships team at Swiss Nex in India and I'm glad to be a part of this event in the presence of these esteemed experts and uh, panelists so let us now move to the presentation um I'm going to be talking about giving you a brief overview about mobility as a service the current state in India and the opportunities 
uh, for different organizations, companies, and access to a large market. So let me first start with a very simplified definition of mobility as a service. Um, for me, mobility as a service is a seamless way to get from point A to point B uh, by combining the various available mobility options. Um, that's a very simplified definition. However, uh, we can go beyond this definition and we can describe mass as being demand driven and a distribution model uh, which is delivered through a single interface platform uh, through a service provider. An ideal mass platform seeks to offer a tailored service package based on the needs of the user, just like that of, a, of your mobile service plan. Um, now, optimization is at the core of mobility as a service. We are always trying to seek out an equilibrium price, trying to match supply and demand. And since mobility as a service is demand driven, uh, there can be better optimization of the available services. Um, now let us also look at the key components of mobility as a service. Um, yes, so we, we are looking at buying mobility services instead of vehicles. Currently, India is witnessing a clear rise when it comes to shared mobility. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So I'm talking about the buying of mobility services and India is clearly seeing a rise of the shared mobility economy, both in the two wheeler and four wheeler segment. Uh, buying of mobility services in public transport is still at a very nascent stage currently. And uh, this provides a unique opportunity for companies like Fairtech India who offer unique ticketing solutions. And they are doing some good work in India, Europe, and they are trying to access the markets in Southeast Asia as well. Um, yes. Sorry, I'll have to just pause for a moment. Uh, I can't seem to uh, get this on full screen. I've been trying for a while. Yeah, just excuse me. Yeah, I hope this is better now. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, so uh, next is India clear, severely lacks interconnected public and private transportation services. And again, this is an area of opportunity. So personalized application services, dynamic journey management, flexible payment solutions, transactions, journey planning solutions is still an area of exploration for India's transport infrastructure and it clearly is lagging behind. So definitely there can be a clear plug-in for organizations who are planning to enter the Indian market. Um, uh, mobility as a service by nature is demand driven instead of regulated supply. So again, dynamic routing and demand driven supply will enable efficient use of resources, especially in the public transportation space. Uh, we can see a clear disruption and transition in the micro mobility space in India. Uh, however, we are not seeing it as much in the public transport space. Uh, the state transport units, which are looking at uh, managing the bus services, uh, desperately need to up update their ITS systems, the intelligent service systems, and integrate analytical tools into their monitoring systems. Um, so again, an area of opportunity. Um, yes, so optimization is at the core of mobility as a service. This slide is quite self-explanatory. Um, now let's look at the trends in India's mobility sector. What we are witnessing is an exponential push being given to electrification uh, and mobility service providers were the worst hit uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak because the government gave a huge policy push. There was a lot of incentives being given to private companies 
but uh, the pandemic put a halt to these advances however now the situation is improving and companies in the segment are aiming to accelerate some of their larger plans and take the green route uh mobility companies are expecting a strong recovery in the electric vehicle segment and are now doubling down on their efforts just to give you some numbers uber india plans to have approximately 3000 electric vehicles and auto rickshaws uh and uh, which are tuk tuks across the 2 3 and 4 wheeler segment on its platform uh by the end of 2022 uh similarly two wheel urban mobility solution provider bounce which is currently one of the biggest uh two wheeler mobility service providers is transitioning their entire fleet to electric two wheelers by the third quarter of 2022 um uh, and it is collaborating with various local indigenous companies when it comes to production of electric motors for its fleet uh there is also a rise of the used car market in india and people um initially were avoiding public transport when the pandemic broke out and were choosing to commute in their own vehicles and this behavioral change was seen throughout the world especially uh people who could afford and also young millennials um now the young millennials instead of uh, paying high upfront costs and going through um the process of expensive loans are preferring pre-owned cars and this is a big market to be explored in the country uh, according to a report by KPMG nearly 22.5% of consumers who had planned to purchase a new car will now go for a used vehicle um next of course uh, which is at the core of mobility as a service is adoption of the subscription model uh leasing and subscription models are clearly gaining a lot of favor and popularity amongst indian millennials who are obviously seeking greater flexibility and convenience and uh, seeking for mobility services on back and call uh the shift towards an asset light lifestyle is driving a demand for such mobility models um now as the global economy is facing a recession due to the pandemic subscribing for a mobility service or even a car rental might seem to be like a smarter choice than buying a car um and hence works out to be substantially cheaper than buying a new car up front so pay as you go is clearly the way forward for india's millennials um then there's an increased shared um of a uh, share of personal mobility solutions as well um and this includes micro mobility solutions um so electric two wheelers is is something which gained a lot of popularity during the pandemic due to the need for social distancing and personal hygiene so consumers were preferring to drive uh, private vehicles in the short and medium term but the growth is expected to plateau in this year and also in the long term given the adoption of other mobility models and the kind of kind of dynamic policy making which is being seen at the national level in india uh i just wanted to show you a picture of peak hour traffic in delhi so that it makes it very relatable to you and just to tell you delhi is the city where you can see transit oriented development happening at its core but yet you see this kind of peak hour traffic um in the city um now let us look at the kind of innovation we are seeing in india's public transportation systems one unique move which the central government has made is introducing the national common mobility card now this can be a huge game changer because the metros in india the metro cities are investing a lot in building their core transportation systems now what i mean is metro systems also investing extensively in their bus systems so the state transport units are spending in spending a lot of funds allocating a lot of funds for the metro and the bus systems so this national common mobility card was introduced with the objective of making indian cities truly multimodal in nature uh this idea was conceived by the ministry of housing and urban affairs which is under the ambit of the central government now what the mobility card seeks to cover is uh, mobility segments like the bus 
metro, suburban rail, toll, parking, smart city uh, solutions and retail. This is similar to the Oyster card in London and the Cacao card which you see in Seoul. Um, the National Common Mobility Card is also contributing extensively to India's smart city mission, which is another initiative by the government to have IoT enable cities with transport oriented development driving this change. Uh, another feature of the NCMC card is the automated fare collection feature and this is becoming a reality as mobility companies can plug into the infrastructure which is being created by the government. So this is a very ambitious project which is still in its nascent stages and you will see uh, my next slide uh, only Delhi Metro, the Delhi Metro network has fully adopted this. And this is expected to be fully integrated into the, into the Delhi Metro system by the end of 2022. And the Delhi Metro is, the, is India's uh, second oldest and largest metro system. Um, this card will also prevent people from carrying multiple cars while traveling in different cities and provide for a seamless service. Other Indian cities are also seeing the success of this card during the pilot phases and the testing. And Mumbai Metro, uh, which is expected to be the second biggest metro system in the country is collaborating with MasterCard and Axis Bank and they have launched the One Mumbai One Metro card with the objective of achieving multi-modality. The Mumbai Metro project um, is being extensively funded centrally and also by private players uh, and the Japan International Cooperation Agency JICA is also funding this project. Uh, the city clearly has ambitious plans and has been collaborating with think tanks, private organizations to expand its public transport capabilities through an ex expansive metro project. Uh, the Kochi Metro Rail Corporation has also launched the Kochi One mobile app, which can plug into the NCMC card infrastructure. So clearly you can see with this trend, Indian cities are adopting and ex accepting multi-modality uh, and they know it's going to be the core of their transportation systems, especially with the rise of, you know, um, uh, private vehicle, with the increase in private vehicles, with the rise of micro mobility. So the government clearly has had to invest in the digital infrastructure. You will see that in my latest slide where I talk about the smart cities mission as well. Uh, and also just to mention in my previous role as a mobility specialist at World Resources Institute India, I was part of this unique project called STAMP, which stands for Station Access and Mobility Program. Now this was a collaborative effort by WRI, startup incubators and government to bring out the best solutions in urban mobility in the country. Uh, it is currently being organized every year and it is being run in a challenge format with solutions being offered, grants, and uh, along with an opportunity to work with city governments as well as with the Department of Urban Land Transport in India. Uh, just want to give you a snapshot of the modal share when it comes to Indian cities. As you can see, in India, people choose to walk and use public transport. Um, I mean, in other, in other cities and countries, you have a choice, like you, pre preferably you have a choice. But in India, we have a lot of affordability constraints and not everybody has the luxury to afford even private modal services. And for this very reason, multimodality in public transport is key with micro mobility services expected to play a key auxiliary role to provide a comprehensive transport infrastructure. Uh, and also this report by the Council of Energy, Environment and Water and Shakti Foundation clearly highlights the importance of public transport and walkability. So providing a very good walkable infrastructure in and around the metro systems and doing a deep dive analysis on the infrastructure um, around the, the core public transport systems in cities becomes paramount. Now, these are the barriers to using public transport and as I mentioned the quality of infrastructure around the metros becomes a huge issue in Indian cities. Uh, it also becomes an issue of road safety and the second issue you will see is the frequency of service of uh, bus systems in the country. Uh, with uh, the rise of millennials and, uh, and um, the rising upper middle class in India, the afford people have started to afford micro mobility and private mobility solutions. 
and because of that you are seeing an increase in private uh, uh, private modes of transport to so to negate that probably you will have to ensure that the current metro systems and the bus systems are optimized to the uh, to the convenience of the end user this is uh, this is an area where fatic uh, as a company has huge potential and opportunity and they are currently exploring the same in the in in, in indian cities uh, also the city governments are earmarking large amounts of funds to ambitious public transportation projects and providing incentives and last mile connectivity services will go a long way in increasing the ridership across the different uh, different public transport systems which are existing in our cities uh so um now we we we'll look at the expected mobility drivers for the country um what we are seeing is on the policy side there is an extensive um an ambitious fame to scheme uh which is the faster adoption and manufacturing of hybrid and electric vehicle scheme uh this scheme was originally intended for a period of 3 years uh and which is supposed to end on 30 in 31st march 2022 however it was extended earlier this year by a period of 24 months till 31st march 2024 uh the government is trying to extend extensively push for the manufacturing of electric vehicles indigenously and it the the scheme has an outlay of usd 1.2 billion so clearly it's a very ambitious project which seeks to provide incentives for manufacturing uh in india um also next another policy hello yeah sorry i just heard something yeah the next policy which i want to mention and which is key for um adoption of a multi modality in india for indian cities is the national policy on transit oriented development so the ministry of housing and urban affairs introduced the national policy in 2017 and this yes yeah sure 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 yes so let me just go on to the smart cities mission which i think would be relevant um so the government has launched the smart cities mission in 2015 and it is the main objective of this policy is to improve the life in cities by providing promoting a sustainable environment for smart solutions so this includes transit oriented development iot solutions in the transportation sector um now for cities to acquire funds under this policy uh the they need to comply with the national urban transportation policy which was launched in 2014 which is basically a rule book for urban transportation solutions in indian cities and let us now look at digitization so clearly there is fair integration which is happening in india nfc systems are being introduced um and you are seeing a lot of technological progress in the micro mobility space however we are not seeing that extensively in the public transportation space and if the inf- if a push for this kind of for these kind of solutions is given by the central government uh companies like fatic would benefit hugely uh with the kind of work they are doing and they can introduce a seamless uh fare and ticketing system uh my concluding thoughts now uh i believe that transportation systems can be quite complex as we've heard from other speakers uh there is autonomous intelligent um, a- um there's ai there is uh, autonomous vehicles you will see uh, ticketing solutions and of course policy forms a big chunk and component of this entire mobility as a service paradigm so um we have made great strides across the world however my personal belief is that last mile feeder services is the final puzzle in the jigsaw and a good last mile connectivity system will enable indian cities to have a well laid out transportation system only then i believe we can truly call it smart mobility for smart cities that's about it from my end thank you very much pleasure thank you thank you so very much so our next speaker is uh, dr ayman smadi um, he's the director of mena at center of transport excellence uae he is responsible for the development and implementation of uatp's service and research program in the middle east and north africa region he serve 
he serves as the membership base of transport authorities, operators, industry, and consultancy. He holds a PhD in transportation engineering. So the floor is yours. Uh, he is also online. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I must apologize. I, I have to run in five minutes exactly to another appointment. Um, and I'm sorry I'm joining you also virtually. Um, I don't have a presentation, so I will speak for the next few minutes a little bit to kind of collect things maybe and, and, and summarize and, and share the perspective uh, of the UITP, which is the International Association for Public Transport. As you know, we, we involve all the stakeholders involved in urban mobility. And, and to me, I guess, um, just to kind of redefine a little bit uh, the concept of mobility as a service, I, I believe it is really a natural evolution uh, that was caused by, by the growth in digitalization. Um, and probably all of you recall, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we started hearing about Uber and other service providers, they were uh, referred to as uh, disruptive technologies. Uh, they really, uh, I mean, provided a wake-up call, if you will, for the sector. And, and so uh, the transformation that we are looking at is that going from uh, fixed, rigid services where we are telling the users, um, here's what we have. You know, we have uh, a metro that runs on a certain schedule. You, in order to catch a bus, you have to walk 200 meters, 300 meters, etc. go to the bus stop. You wait five minutes or 10 minutes for the schedule and you use the bus. If you want to use a taxi, you have to go to a taxi rank. Um, or you have to, if you're lucky, to hail a taxi. And, and many of us know who traveled across the world. If you are in a large city, especially during the peaks, it's very hard to find a taxi. And, and so on and so forth. And, and, and in reality, the users with the introduction of the, uh, we call them transport network uh, companies, such as Uber, um, they, they got used to, to the, the concept that they should be able to determine when they travel, how they travel. And, and so this is, this, uh, first of all, having some control, having the flexibility, and having options. And, and so mobility as a service really came um, to take advantage of this trend, if you will, and also to compete, uh, because there were, at some point, some cities in the U.S. I, I heard uh, the professor speak about the U.S. and California, specific, some smaller cities who were dealing with the burden of providing public transportation to a small ridership segment where the majority of people were relying on their private vehicles, it is not economically feasible. Uh, so you're asking the transport operators to provide a service for a few people, and so economically it's not possible. You're looking at a lot of subsidies, and the people are not happy because the service is poor. So it, you, know, you have a, a two-way equation where nobody is happy. And so for us, mobility as a service is about integration, number one. It's integrating all the different services. And of course, it is favoring sustainable urban mobility modes uh, with public transport being at the core and building around it so that we are um, realizing the policies, the strategic policies of a city or a region, because this is also very important. If we are moving towards sustainable mobility, it's very important for whether it is an organizing authority um, or a transport authority, etc. Uh, that we are exercising the right policies to encourage sustainable urban mobility so that we have a balance, if you will, in the system. And that balance can only happen if we are providing the right options and we are providing a seamless interface. And for, on the other hand, for, for the users, then we are providing excellent service, easy interface. Uh, you know, there was talk from my colleagues earlier about payment systems, about, uh, you know, mobile applications. We have so many successful platforms that are in operation today that demonstrate this. So you could be looking at a variety of options to move around, including uh, shared vehicles. Uh, and they could be autonomous, they could be electric, uh, but, but the core of it is, is this integration. Mm. And indeed, there's a lot of data exchange that has to happen. Um, and there has to be trust because uh, you are dealing with multiple operators and, and you know, uh, commercially, operators, they don't like to share their data, even with the regulating authority. So imagine sharing data with other operators, with competitors. So there's got to be some, some extra value for them. And, and, and the operators who have been uh, operating under this ecosystem in the past few years have seen the benefit by increased users. So regardless of where you sit within this formula, mass promises to increase the business. Um, 
So there is there is really a notion, like I said, of, of uh, integration, and it's something that will continue to happen. And the technology is only making it easier uh, by providing this this connectivity. Um, so what what we see uh, at UITP clearly is that uh, this indeed is is a trend uh, that will continue. It has a lot of uh, you know requirements for success. Um, clearly, there is. Uh, the policy strategic level that has to be exercised, uh, like I said, by, by some kind of an authority. Then you, you need to have the right regulations, um, whether it is related to autonomous specifically or how these services are, are handled, the service standards. There are different business models for doing this as well. Uh, it could be one of the large operators in the region or a city that could be the provider of mass, or it could be an extra layer, an additional layer, a third party, if you will, that deal with the different operators. We have also some models, including Dubai, where uh, the government or the authority establishes the platform um, and, and they deal with the operators as well. So there are so many different models, but the key concept is keeping the customer in mind, providing the flexibility, providing the integration so that it is absolutely seamless, and then there's extra value for every stakeholder in, in this form. So this is the, what I would like to sh share with you. I hope it's helpful. And like I said, I apologize because I have to jump uh, to another meeting. I'll, I'll stay around for one or two minutes if, in, in case there are questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions uh, for doctor? Yeah, yeah please. Thank you. So uh, you've spoken about uh, sharing data and the need to share data in this particular um, uh, context. Uh, but um, the side of the user was not mentioned, neither in your talk nor in any other one. So what about data privacy in general and users' privacy, who are the ones generating this data? Thank you very much uh, for this question. Indeed, uh, I, I probably mentioned trust. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost like a contract where you are specifying uh, what will be shared and what will not be shared. And, and I, I, 20 years ago, maybe, when I was working in the United States and we started working on intelligent transport system, everybody was worried about, you know, privacy and Big Brother, etc. And you look where we are today, and it seems like we, we gave up uh, you know, some of those notions, uh, how we worry or how we consider uh, our privacy, because I, I, anybody who has a mobile phone, as you know, has zero privacy, uh, you know, whether by choice or whether by all the different apps that are looking at what we are doing. Um, so indeed, though, uh, there are uh, provisions within these arrangements, uh, and this is why I mentioned at the top uh, the need to have the regulations and the need to have this public layer that will ensure the service standards and indeed whatever policies, whatever standards are there for, for data privacy, for whatever community you are looking at, and that varies of course by community, uh, they need to be uh, adapted in the system indeed. So, you know, some of us may be willing to give up some privacy uh, for the sake of convenience, uh, some maybe not, uh, and they will have different functionalities, yes. uh, degrees of functionalities of the system. We have no choice. We're making all this uh, necessary to life. <laughs> so that we have I'm no sorry. choice. Like what I'm hearing from you is that um, there's no choice. Like we have to give in. And also I, another. I didn't another say that. No, <laughs> I didn't say that. I, what, what I'm saying is that there are standards for privacy in each community, and those standards have to be implemented in the system. Okay. Then at the individual level, voluntarily, I may choose to give out more data about myself to get tailored service. So, I mean, it's a choice that I make. I'm not forced to, to, uh, to do it. Okay. Uh, I didn't say that there's no So no, how, no how do you operate within the GDPR laws? Or maybe I should sorry, ask yeah. it for the panel later. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you so very much for your time. And if you're around uh, yes. for the fireside chat later on, we'll be happy to have you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please, could you please? Oh, yes. I'm sorry, we ah. lost. Uh, he might. No, I was going to ask him because he talked about business models. He, uh, yeah. he 
Microphone. I know you're going to say something about that. And uh, the trust that will be shared, um, but also he said the public layer, he talked about a public layer that will be set a kind of an arbitrator between all the stakeholders in order for them to achieve something. And I actually was going to ask him, would, you, would he be willing to write something about that? So, uh -huh. so we may then yeah, but we can contact, we can, we can contact him, him, yes. So uh, there is a small change in the agenda, uh, and that is we'll be having a break uh, after the speech, uh, visionary speech. Oh, uh, Professor Manzo, if, yeah. I, if I may. So sure. what's, what we're going to do right now is have a, um, have a break, and then we will be resuming it Take him. at uh, 4 p.m. Thank you. Uh, are we offline? Okay. So, what we have a last minute change in the sense that. How long is the break? So, right now we're going to have Florian Trosch from Schindler, leading figure of Schindler, who's going to give us his presentation right now. Now, the thing is, he can't do this recorded because he's going to share exclusively industrial information. So we, we, that's, that's the reason why we cannot record this. And so, Dr. Florian, the... Hello, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Mass is a solution. The question is, mass is a solution for what? For what problem? Yeah. And for whom? Yes. So if <laughs> mass is a solution, what is the problem? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the way to And who problem. has the problem? Exactly. <laughs> what is... What is the problem, the nature of the problem, who's suffering from this problem, and, or is it just, again, we have opportunities to use, to create technology with just creating it. Right, that's what it is. So think about not only technology, but the human dimensions and then the other stuff. I mean, one of the speakers, I think he, he brought up this public layer in the infrastructure. If you look at a lot of the models that have been proposed, there is no public layer there. Public layer was some of the issue that uh, Dr. Fida raised in terms of. Uh, okay, some of the issues uh, that uh, were raised here is privacy, you know, and privacy is extremely important. And I can see that people are repeating the same sense again. I mean, as if like we have to give up on our privacy. It doesn't. No, uh, privacy for me is is a way to manage data with accountability, really, because for now, I. I when I say I want to have private life, it doesn't mean that I'm having something to hide. I'm not, I'm not fearful of committing. If, I com if somebody committed a crime, I would like to find out about this person and I would like him to be in jail. The problem is if your information uh, uh, um, uh, lands in the hands of a, a bad person, that, that person can take you know, advantage of that fact and do things that could be harmful to you. Okay? Uh, here, for, for, for the system, you're going to be sharing, say, you know, cars, rides, you're going to be sharing mobility with lots of people and so on and so forth. And there is a huge privacy implications in there. Um, companies and stakeholders will be competing with each other, will be also sharing the data. Remember, we're supposed to be providing information real-time for people who are driving. We're supposed to be providing information real-time to authorities in case there is disturbance, there is anything like that for the country. The question is, where does privacy belong in here? Okay, so those are two issues that we can explore for a while. Then I, <laughs> then I stop. Uh, but we were joking when we listened to Schindler. Each of these elevators has a camera in there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's filmed. Yes. Okay, so who <laughs> wants to take this one? Uh, the first or the second question? Uh, whatever, maybe we can ask. including yourself here. <laughs> thank you. Well, actually, the, the, the question asked... Thank you. The first um, topic that you mentioned, what is it that you are trying to solve? What the solution, what is it trying to solve? Exactly. And, of course, it has social aspect and technical aspect, regulatory aspect, governance aspect. So it has actually many stakeholders. And when we talk about stakeholders here, it's not necessarily to talk about individual stakeholders, but rather bodies, regulator, uh, communities, uh, cities, uh, corporates, 
So all these, th all these guys, we have to go and check what is it that they need so that we can put a proper question of around why we need the mass. It's yeah. not one question from one party. It's a collective, collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'll just have a comment on it. Uh, so, of course, we can have many uh, objectives, many objective functions, but what I think the problem boils down to having the quality of life when it comes to mobility within now in the urban uh, areas. That's and the, the whole idea is uh, achieving the different objectives, uh, which could be like um, uh, traffic efficiency, uh, road safety, but still providing the right set of the mobility solutions to the people moving from point A to point B within the urban complex environments and that could be multi-model or whatever. So that's what I think from the first perspective. But your second question, that interests me a bit more. Uh, we were working together with uh, T-Systems. I, I should not name it. Uh, so they have this data of the call records, what you say is the mobile. And they, they really know, uh, like, where which uh, mobile user was moving from where to where they they have all this data and then they have a sister company and that sister company is uh, uh, is really capitalizing on the data that they have to create the solutions which could go to the marketing which could go to other places so although we think that we are preserving our privacy but i am exposing myself my mobility which can be exploited without me knowing it. So mobility, the, the same thing could happen in this case also. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to um, continue on what, what's been said. Um, I think th there is a gentleman who uh, uh, put, a, put in a definition for mass as a a solution for uh, it's a, as an optimization solution for for problem uh, and to minimize the cost and then really when you think uh, I think the gentleman from Fairtech yeah Fair Fairtech um, and then again if you look at it from the operator or the provider service provider is really just uh, it's it's uh, it's it's optimizing the revenue. Uh, it's uh, really um, the it's a productivity problem, which is moving as m as many as many uh, people as possible with a minimum cost possible. And then this cost, uh, we often translate it as uh, we are minimizi minimizing the cost for 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 customers. But really. This is where mini we're, we're minimizing the cost for the, uh, for, for the uh, operators. Uh, this is can be uh, looked at um, uh, this way, but also there are other uh, um, agendas like uh, minimizing congestion, minimizing, um, there are a lot of indirect costs like pollution. Also, people can be um, looking at it from um, an ecological point of view, which is uh, trying to minimize the, the, the pollution and uh, minimize the number of vehicles um, um, in, in, in the environment. Uh, so it's really is a complex, multivariate problem. And it is an optimization problem. Uh, but also we can look at it from a, bi a ubiquity, uh, like the, the last gentleman uh, uh, so even though he put the numbers like uh, maximizing the the number of uh, um, people transported vertically, uh, he gave an example for elevators, which is plus 25 percent, uh, and minimizing the number of uh, minimizing actually the energy consumption. Uh, I believe 40 percent. Yes. So these are are good. We'd like to see these numbers, um, and and I think. Uh, uh, in your case, I, I, 
I thought to ask you this question, and maybe you can, uh, as part of your uh, discussion, you can you can answer it. Uh, what is the performance results of Fertech? Um, I know you presented some figures, but uh, I didn't get it. Uh, maybe you can you can comment to that or elaborate. And how did it help in 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 what way also? So this is could uh, enrich the, uh, the debate as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. So to add, add to uh, Professor Manzu's point, I mean, certain features are good to have features, but those features come at a very high ecological cost. So, I mean, who owns that calculating this environmental cost? Is it the universities? Is it the private companies? So private companies are driven for, for profit. So features, at the end of the day, private companies actually evaluate how much they can make money out of every feature. So, so that way somebody has to own, is it the regulator? So somebody has to own uh, uh, the amount of, I mean, boils down to privacy also. So, and uh, uh, coming to FATX, you know, the, the, uh, the one we believe, like every feature we add, so how is is it going to impact users life right so for example an in uh, performance numbers so one uh, uh, campaign we did uh, where uh, we had this uh, geofencing where mall of switzerland so everybody who uses a public transport to go to mall of switzerland on a weekend gets a discounted public transport ride and this saw almost like 27 percent footfall increased footfall so like this campaigns and another campaign where we promoted in a certain area uh, where you know people who use public transport if you do so many journeys we plant one tree so certain small campaigns where you educate the user about his or her environmental footprint and as a private company uh, as a social responsibility what we deliver and what they can deliver so it's it's like collaborative effort right to actually do something so that's where we don't want to get multiple uh, uh, i mean not to build good to have features or fancy features which pe it might not help people like i don't i don't want to get up in the morning and see multiple <coughs> choices for me oh yeah i can take a e-bike i can take a shared this thing i can take a car i don't want to know because i know where i where i want to go <coughs> i pretty much follow the same thing for me it boils down to cost and time like, will it save my time? Will it reduce the price for me? That's all I'm bothered about. So these are some of the fundamental factors as a human we always think when we are developing features. So, yeah, so that that's what, I mean, we as a company try to, you know, follow, make, uh, I mean, kind of balance between the profit and environment and also delivering value for the end users. Yeah. I'm not criticizing you in particular, but I published a paper, uh, not myself paper, I'm an editor of a journal, and they analyzed the algorithms that simply, they don't even sell anything, they make recommendations. You want to go from A to B? <laughs> if you take this, uh, take you so much time. If you take this, Google, there, here, the, the other. And they just compare what comes out, huge database in Germany, <laughs> what they recommend and what the reality is. They compare it against the reality, okay? Because in that city they had all the sectors. And the algorithms are not neutral. The algorithm for Mercedes, from Mercedes and BMW, they tip systematically downplay public transport. It's always longer than it is. Uh, the ones, the public transport, they, they oversh oversell public. So, so, and I'm not even saying it's deliberate, but, but, <laughs> In itself, the algorithm cannot, you optimize something, you know, which you think is the thing you want to optimize. And, and you make the point yourself. At some point, you need a regulator that basically says, okay, that's within the limits and that's not within the limit. Or I don't know, but, but, but I wanted to make that point. You know, it's not just, uh, and you're right, everybody who, and it doesn't make a, a difference whether it's a public operator or a private operator, everybody op optimizes something. 
I, actually, that's what I, that's what I wanted to, to, to bring up, this, what is the problem? So I, if you think about it, uh, mass is everything but your private car, okay? Now, if you take that perspective and that framework, so what do, what you're confronted with, 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 with the decision, really, in how do I design the system? Uh, you say, what is the problem? Well, the problem for me, for urban people, the problem is different from rural people. For urban people, the problem is not the car. The car gives us freedom, gives us ability to move whenever we want and all that stuff instead of relying on a system that will give us car what we want. So the problem is not the car. The problem for us is why am I driving the car to go to work? That's the problem. A rural area is actually the opposite. The car is the problem. Why? Because I don't have ways to go anywhere. And therefore, if you can achieve any goal, then, the, then... Now, the question is, you can't have this as a zero-sum game, right? A zero-sum game is one party wins, the other party loses. The, 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 yes, the car people, the private owners lose, and the other one win. But the wealth is not created. The wealth is zero, if not negative, right? So if we're going to approach that from a zero-sum game, then really mass does not help us resolve these issues. And this is why I ask this question, if, if mass is a solution, can we talk about the problem? Can you marry these two paradigms in a way, the rural and the urban, and be able to provide a solution that actually address problems that are clearly not the same, and then do it in the best way possible? That's what I really meant. Anyway, okay, and so if, I, if I may, the provocative thing. I want to sure, push this yes, further, yeah. okay? Um, and you rightly analyzed, you know, mass, the uptake of mass is not what was sold to us. It didn't really, my doctoral student analyzed Finland, why didn't it work in Helsinki, uh, things like that, all the ob obstacles and all that. Okay, so <coughs> I personally came to the conclusion, mass is not an answer to the problem of the individual. It is a problem to the cities. They have congestion. They have pollution, they don't have space, they have all kind of, and they want a more optimal solution. Yes. And somehow we're selling mass as an answer to the people's problem, where it should be an answer to the public yes. policy problem. And implicitly, even in your speech, <laughs> that's what you're doing. I see, what, what, have you looked at the latest advertisement of Uber? We are a public yes. service company, yes. okay? Yes. We approach the city government, <laughs> you have problems, and we help you to better organize the traffic in the city. Okay? And I think that's more honest and, and probably, and what they are searching for is public-private partnership contracts with the public authorities, <laughs> and maybe that's what exactly what you're trying to do. And I think that should be the strategy to help them solve their mobility problems and you want greener you want faster you want more efficient you want less parking i don't know we'll put it into the algorithm and we solve the problem and the citizens and the users okay they will comply because they have no other choice as dr fida says you know <laughs> yes sir. Yeah, i mean at least i mean i think i really think that. Let, let's read it first and then you <laughs> that way everybody gets a chance to say something okay uh, so I just wanted to comment um, on uh, privacy as a definition because the way I hear the responses, yes. I feel that this has to be um, uh, clarified. Privacy is not about keeping the data. It's about sharing it while preserving the privacy of the users. Yeah. So here you have a set of techniques that helps you share data. People tend to equate it to confidentiality. It's not. It's about how can I share data while respecting users. So this is uh, one point I wanted to talk about. And there is a lot of research in location privacy. How to anonymize location privacy, how can you share it while respecting users. So the idea is that um, how can we benefit from this research, putting it together with mass, for example, and have some kind of privacy by design. So instead of having it as an afterthought, um, I'm not sure if this is already done, but these two could be put together and research could be, I mean, you could benefit from this research and have it by design into mass. Yes. 
as you were uh, telling about the privacy yeah there exists options but only thing is somebody has to own that right so now most of the companies are making money off the data so as long as somebody does not come and give a credible solution okay uh, this is users personal information and this is the data that you need to give a value to the user so personal information and data are bundled up today so because i need to deliver value so i need data but i don't need information as a private company but right now it it comes together so we need i think this is where research comes in exactly how can you how can you privately put so how can you use privacy and there's a, i mean this is this is also something that the privacy research works on so how can you leverage or take use of what's already been done and use it to solve your problems like we for example in healthcare you have a patient who goes to a million hospitals and then when you want to share the data you want to share the data of the same patient but without knowing the identity so this is something that is already uh, researched and talked about and yes. used but i i already want to add something because i think you say a good point but i think technology made it even harder than that i give you an example you said if i own my data i am responsible i can use it as ever let me give you an example god forbid your brother now i'm not down at this example somebody's brother has uh, committed a crime okay and then they go to his brother and then be able to lure his brother to give his dna so the brother gives his dna and that dna can implicate his brother in a murder even though he does not own that data right and he does not do any uh, he he is not consenting in anything to be done with it but this indirect association because you and your brother share the same dna so if you give your dna to the police that can have your brother ending up i mean the the fate of your brother would be end up in what would you do in this case he's not giving he's not allowing his information to be shared but indirectly through you he has to give information away and that's ex so i think the notion of privacy huh Open question yes, of privacy. So, exactly. So when you when you give uh, your DNA, you are um, consenting for yourself, but that has a lot of implication not only on your brother, on your exactly. family, on your relatives, on your cousins. But let's assume I'm not in good terms with my brother. Okay, <laughs> I'm making a hundred thousand dollars out of this, right? <laughs> and then I'm going to give my DNA. The rest is out of my hand. All what I'm selling my DNA. The implication of that that you would be going to jail. I don't care. Do that you know actually happened in real life. There was a really? case where <laughs> one went to jail because his brother was uh, had his information public, his yes. DNA information. So I, I want to kind of demystify the fact that it's just about on ownership of the data. It's a little bit more difficult than that. Yes, yeah. it is. I, I'm yeah. not saying that it's not difficult. However, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of research in uh, location privacy, which is highly related to mass, and. If there is a will to, of course, the will comes either from wanting to have ethics built into your systems or having the obligation through uh, laws, one of these two. Yes. And, for example, uh, in, in Europe, you have a very strong law against, um, which, which gives a lot of um, ownership to the users. So given that, for example, in order to implement any of this, in Europe, you have to be thinking about privacy, you have to build it into your system, and you can, uh, um, the best idea, because a lot of companies are now struggling after the inception of GDPR, how to incorporate this into their, their working. And um, since you have now a new system that you are thinking about, you are building, the best way to go about it is to have, to design privacy into it from but the how? beginning. how? The problem is how? I, I think location is an important matter. But if you look at the journey, this is why I want to put this in a context. Because a lot of people don't understand that this is pre all the way up until the post journey. So now if I'm trying to say, I I'm showing off this car, I wanted to impress, impress somebody with my car. But they have no idea to know whether this is like a, a shared car or a borrowed car or actually I bought it myself. And if I'm trying to impress with it, sometimes it gives, somebody gives me away because he happens to ha work with one of the companies or service provider that started this contract with me. 
then all of a sudden that is not about location, that's about intention and about what I'm doing and all that stuff. And now it's exposing me and what I'm doing as opposed to really just the location I have. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's a whole chain of things. The location is one of them for people to find out where you are at time T. But there are other aspects of, of, of life that sometimes will have an impact on decisions that are made about you. Sometimes people say, if you have this Cadillac, that you must be rich, right? But if that Cadillac happens to be borrowed for a couple of hours, I mean, that changes completely the story, right? So that's what I'm saying. Is little, we understand that privacy has to be by design. The question is how difficult the problem is. Should that be social uh, regulation that will... And for me, regulation and accountability have to be part of this as a deterrence, not as a problem solution. Uh, you, um, I just want to um, add to this uh, the privacy issue. It's, it's a big debate, and I don't think it's going to... Uh, but I want to say that uh, the gentleman, he was saying we are not forced to accept the terms of the privacy, but actually we are because all applications and services rely heavily on us customers uh, giving up a little bit on our privacy. And then again, it's, it's, on an, on a, it, it's very simple. The uh, Dr. Trosh, who, uh, he was uh, given uh, the example of the elevator sensing you when you come and then it opens. The same thing to the door. So if you don't give up your privacy, the elevator will never open to you. It's, it's as simple as that. So they need to know who you are, where you are, usually what time you come to the to the building uh, is there somebody else who is somebody else next to you so the door is not uh, so all this is look at uh, whatsapp as an example just to name this if you don't share your contacts then it's, it's become uh, and they make it that way uh, they make it that way it becomes not flexible and this is just an example. And all of the, they need because their value added from commercial point of view is based on who we are, what is the, a, a, the range of age we are, uh, our nationality, our f uh, like uh, shopping habits and, and things. Uh, and this is becomes flexible to us. But this is, it's not necessarily a vile thing. They, they'd like to uh, infringe on our privacy. So it's better, uh, it's uh, simply telling them, the, the providers, service provider, uh, tell us a little bit more about you the, so I can serve you better. That's their message. But sometimes they sell that uh, information to others. If, if uh, I could just, yeah, please, I don't, don't want to take the whole time. I just want to uh, point out one thing, which is um, it's not an easy solution. Uh, no one can have answers to all of this. We have to think about it. We have to do research in this area. But for example, um, th your first example, hashing, for example, the information that the elevator gets from you is, is one idea, for example. How can we solve this one by one is something that we have to deal with, but we have to be willing to think about this problem. This is the, the issue. Uh, yeah, uh, this is. Uh, uh, I just wanted to share an example of a project that we did in Berlin. So um, the idea there was that we needed to deploy a bunch of sensors, uh, and most, some of them were really video-based sensors. And uh, so I was responsible for bigger pro part of that work. Uh, and it was quite easy a job for me because from originally where I come, if I put a camera somewhere. I would be happy and everybody would be, would be happy to take my picture on, on the road. So, But it was a big problem. Okay. And the okay. yeah, it was a big problem. The problem was that we were not allowed to put a camera before we followed a bunch of steps and protocols, and one of which was that the data has to be anonymized within the sensor inside before it goes to the data center. And this is what I guess you're talking about. So there are there are to be rules and uh, on the edge. things. Yeah. On the edge. Yeah. It and it must. And the second thing was that you need to put uh, something on the, the camera and which could be read by everyone. Put a contact number. If they have any problem, they should contact you, and you should explain to them why this sensor is there. There's the acceptability part of it. Yeah. So just wanted to share this. Yeah. While you're passing, uh, Fida. I'm going to ask you, is privacy inherently different in this state, the, in this case, case of mass?
from typical privacy that we deal with, like in hospital health care, is that different? Or do you think that the actual ones? I'm not asking you for an answer. But if you can write like a paragraph or two about this to add, that would be great. Okay? So the question is, privacy is important. It should be done by design. Are there dimensions to this problem that are completely different from what we see in other settings? Or do you think that the technology, if, if somehow we solve the healthcare problem, privacy issues, do we solve the mass issue? Okay. So, I, I mean, I know they don't have the answer, but if you think about it, I think it'll be something that we can put in the document. It would be an interesting question to help. Uh, um, I think Fadi asked for the microphone. I, uh, a quick one, please. Now, in terms of privacy, and I'm not um, prof professional in terms of, um, of data privacy and these things, but how different is our Facebook application, what if whatever it gets? You know, it gets lots of information. So how is it different from the mass that we are talking about? The, the simple Facebook application or LinkedIn application, they extract so much data out of us. And you see that sometimes we talk about something and then immediately we see an advertisement about what we talk. So some people say that they are even listening to us. So how different will it be from, from the mass that we are discussing? Yeah, that's great. I will switch the talk, but uh, it, w it, will, it, will be the, it will be no different anymore when Facebook buys the first mass provider, <laughs> which may well happen. But this is an interesting problem. If it's the same, it's the same, but somebody has to look into it. Yes. Health data everywhere versus Facebook data, for example. Like you cannot go ahead and go to a hospital and, or the hospital itself cannot share data with whoever it wants. So b why? Because there's regulation. There's regulation everywhere for health data. Facebook data, not so much. In Europe, yes. That's why there has been a lot of um, uh, lawsuits and money for Google and Facebook and all of these companies with GDPR. So it, it depends on the regulation. A good point. Okay, uh, I'm not really very much uh, into math, but uh, what I felt from today uh, as a user, okay, uh, that uh, just jumping the things is that uh, from privacy to, to something else, like uh, math is not really designed for family, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's considered people as, as living alone, no. No. right? Like I cannot move to, to I, I cannot use this system no, to no. take my my kids to, to school before I go to work, right? I have to use the car. No. I mean, you c in Finland, in the mass, in the original mass package, you have a family version, which includes, I don't know, even your dog or wh wh whatever you can, and it's just another package. It's just another package that, that you buy. So if you want to have your kids driven to school, then you get this. Uh, the taxi, the, I mean, the, I, I don't remember how, what the prices were, but it's close to, to the you know to luxury business version where you get a taxi within 10 minutes guaranteed you just pay more interesting <laughs> um, do you have a question now no i i wanted to yes, answer his but uh, it's your time to pose a question if you want to i i have another question a total uh, maybe i can relate it a little okay, bit okay okay i can relate it a little bit okay so i think all this is about efficiency okay basically it's, it's efficient. We're making systems more efficient, economically, financially more efficient, ecological more, all that. And the question came to me when I heard Schindler at the very end, you know. People are happier, more social interaction, uh, things like that. And I wonder whether there is not a fundamental contradiction. Is there a contradiction between optimizing absolutely everything, elevators, path, things like that, and having, using this word out of the 70s, when a hippie age, I'm all out, out of this time, you know, conviviality, uh, which is not about efficiency. It's, it's a, can these two things be brought together somehow, you know? Uh, there is a social price for making everything efficient. Um, and I don't buy these arguments, you know, it's, it's going to be, 
I mean, I, I totally buy the argument that digitalization makes urban systems more efficient in many di dimensions. But I don't buy the argument that it will make automatically people happier, uh, more collective social life, things like that. Is there not a fundamental contradiction there? The, 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 I can answer by, 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 by tying up to the, to the smart city part. Mm -hmm. uh, the North Korea, uh, South Korea created smart city and they spent like $60 billion. And then at the end, people were labeling that city to, as a ghost city because people couldn't even have a chance to, took that, to take their garbage out. You know, I, I get blamed I and mean, yelled at by my wife constantly because I don't take the garbage out. And guys from South Korea miss the fact that, hey, they will take cigarettes and then take the garbage out, dump it in there and sit there and then smoke, smoke that cigarette. Yes. So I, I think, and then if you look at Finland, so because, because North Korea drove this exclusively from a technological perspective, and they tried to provide an end-to-end -end solution, whereby you sit home, your TV works by, you can call your food, you can dump your, thra your, your trash from home and it goes all the way down where it's supposed to go, a car comes back and get it, and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, people are not seeing each other anymore. They don't have a chance to meet. When you meet and talk to people, you go and your neighbors say, okay, I'm, I'm doing something. Oh, you're yeah, good. I mean, I can join you. Or something. That conversation has died. And at the end, it was like a ghost city. Nobody was circulating in there. So there must be a trade-off. And that's what the social... The technical system have to have social impact on dimension to that. If you create technology for the sake of technology, it's not going to go anywhere. You can infatuate people, you can wow them, but nobody's going to use it anymore if it doesn't have a uti utilitarian uh, use. So, yes, Fadi. That's why when we ask the question why we need it, we need to segment those. We need to segment those users or those operators or those regulators. If we start by segmentation, we can take each segment and pose this question over that segment. And then we do the analysis and see how the main question can answer most of the needs. We will not answer all the needs by all needs. Definitely, we will not be able to do that. But if we answer most of the needs, then I believe we are right with the, into answering the question for why we need it. It's all about segmentation. Uh, just add to that. So initially when technology started from the 70s, 80s, 90s, the problem most of the tech companies were solving, can we do it? Can we build it? Now it's should we do it? So who owns the accountability of it can be done, but should we do it? Is it required? And it boils down to like who are these people who are going to use it, and how much of value is going to is it actually going to be delivering? So yeah, but somebody has to own. I mean, I I feel it is responsibility, accountability of everybody to own that. Yeah, I want yeah, to yeah. I want to add. I mean. Uh, I made some research for uh, for our upcoming book, uh, the the uh, for the chapter that I'm writing, and you know Professor Sanati asked uh, Professor Alahi, you know is good AI, bad AI, good technology, bad technology. I mean on the flip side, uh, looking into the li literature, you can see that you know auto automated vehicles, okay, you know you have the technology, but you know there is a possibility that it can induce more demand because you know those who cannot access or those who cannot uh, use that means of transport like private cars autonomous vehicles the same thing those who cannot drive for example they will be able to access that and it, it can induce more demand and it can add up to the traffic congestion and there is the case of uber, uber i mean which came out saying that it's shared mobility, efficient, and e everything. But uh, I mean, the latest advertisement it says that it's uh, it's a more comfortable choice compared to public transport. So I mean, uh, we know that u by now Uber is like a taxi company and competing with other modes. So it adds up to the traffic congestion that we, we already have. I mean. 
So, yeah, I wanted to mention this uh, since that you know, we are discussing. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. To this question that you asked about uh, good AI, and it, it was a very interesting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, my mic, is that okay? So, uh, there was a study um, where until you have the fully autonomous vehicle, you need to have the driver sitting behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, this driver needs to take over in the unprecedented events. So, the study showed that, okay, the the simple maneuvers in the simpler environment, the vehicle can take it over, and this, the person who's sitting behind, it may not trust the first two days or two times or multiple times, but after it worked fine for two to three times, then the person sitting behind the wheel start trusting it. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the time, it, it might not be a drunk person, it might be a normal person sitting, a digest, just sitting behind the wheel because I'm trusting. But at the point when it comes to an unprecedented event, then the vehicle's control needs to be taken, but the person is not ready. So this transition of taking the control needs expertise. I guess it might not be a, a bad human being or a good human being. It might be an expert human being or a non-expert human being in this case. I think the point he was trying to make, I think, he said, if we know how to embed ethics in AI, we're going to be... But I, th I, I thought that was the wrong question to ask. Because even... I'm going to give this to you. You can embed ethics in AI. It's impossible. I'm not saying that it is. But assume that you do. AI with eth ethics is still a tool developed by human beings. So if you have a human being that is malicious, he can go and change those ethics and hurt you. So the problem is still revolves around. If you can say that the AI by themselves as agents develop their own ethics, then now you're running this serious problem of this singularity point, this point in time where the smart of the intelligent aim, uh, agents surpasses that of a human, and now our fate would be depending on them. And that's the issue. For me, it's still about a human and what we can do, what we can allow to happen. Uh, with that said, I don't believe that we can, we don't even understand consciousness. We don't understand what the soul is in a way. I mean, I don't think we even advanced beyond what Plato and Socrates did many, 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 mm. many years ago. Okay, I, th I think they... Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. If, if I may add a cultural uh, dimension to that. <laughs> You know, and he has these night, uh, these night, there are two people and one people, and then mm. culturally, somebody would say killing one person is less harmful than killing two, you know? Uh, other culture, they would say old people are old people, uh, so le even if they're 10, <laughs> it's old people. Another culture would say old people have to be pre pre preserved and they should get, you know? So there is a cultural dimension to that, and somebody will program into it, will yeah. program yeah. that yeah. into it. And, and, you know, I mean, rightly so, people, you know, uh, feminist literature, cultural differences, which culture are we going to program in there, you know? <laughs> which is better? <laughs> so so I, I think that we have to be aware of these kind of, these kind of things, and it will end, end up being some American thing at the end, you know? <laughs> it, in, the, in the end, it would just be hardwired ethics. That's yeah, it. Exactly. It just yeah. hardwired. Yeah. And, and maybe if we, I want to come back to the other point about, um, you know, automatization. Uh, automatization. I, I, I have a past as accident investigator for aviation. Mm. Okay? So it's all automatized. The pilot doesn't do anything. Anything. Okay? It's about half a minute and take off and then landing a little bit. Okay? And whenever something occurs during flight, it's automatized. The analysis is automatized. It's too complicated. The pilot, we didn't interview. The pilot tells you it's too complicated. We don't understand. We get a recommendation from the system. And either we trust the system or we don't trust the system. And that's the difference. Okay, so I'll give you that. Just, uh, it's the best story I have. This was this Überlingen accident where two pl planes collided over Swiss airspace. We investigated that, okay? Russian, Russian passenger plane and DHL, okay? And they, they go to each other. The system detects that they fly against each other, okay? 
And the system gives an answer and says, you go up, you go down, okay? Except that the Russian pilot doesn't trust the system. Huh? So he also goes up. <laughs> and, and that's the, you know, that's a problem, yes. But, but it, it shows, you know, I mean, you, it, it was to your point about trusting the... Have you seen the movie Sorry? Sorry. The, uh, the uh, captain yeah. who landed on the on the bridge in which city Boston. was it? Boston. Boston. The system told him that he could make it to the airport, but then yeah. he landed on. Cause, and then he analyzed it in his movie in the movie, saying that I'm um, as a human being, I need some time to grasp and the data and analyze it. And this fraction or few seconds will not allow me to go to the airport, so I had to land. On the, and when they did the simulation by taking these few seconds to account, they found yes, he was right. He couldn't have, he couldn't have made it to the airport. But so a human factor has always been there, and this is where we come to the two terms. Are we dealing with a complicated system or a complex system? I think we are dealing with a complex system where human consciousness and human thinking has to play a major role there. It's not a complicated system. If it were a complicated system, mathematics and physics would solve it. But we're dealing with a complex system. And not only one system, a set of complex systems. Thus, we are creating a systemic, a systemic complexity. One system affecting another system, one complex system affecting another complex system, affecting a third complex system. So, honestly, I don't think that a a software by all, you know, hmm. with all the respect to the, these engineers here, software engineers, I don't think that we can program such a, such a complexity. I doubt. You can, but then you still have to try. Approximation, but when it comes to, human, to, to the human um, value, do you want to risk approximation to decide whether you kill one or two or ten people? Approximation, yes, when it comes to complicated systems, but such a complexity where human, the human is part of the equation, I don't want to trust a, an approximation. But I, I disagree. It's not pr approximation. Look at all these military drones. They go and kill somebody. They know exactly what they do. It's programmed in there, and then there are mistakes. But because they do mistakes. The picture wrong. They do mistakes, you know. right? Yeah, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So when you try to optimize multiple parameters, you need an approximate solution. You yeah. Do okay. But, but these but parameters the belong to a complex system. So in a complex system, do you know all the parameters, or you are just making a deterministic yeah. model? But human lives, or you, yeah, it's not a deterministic system. It's not even a stochastic system. It's God knows what. <laughs> but at some point, you have to decide. Yes, absolutely. <coughs> Can you ask if anybody online wants to speak? I think that nobody is there. I, uh, uh, colleagues joining via Zoom, Cassius, Mr. Mohammed Khan, do you have anything to add to the conversation? Cassius is there. Yes. Um, I just have, I think, all the points made by the experts over there in Dubai were very relevant. Uh, I think mobility as a service is, is complex in nature, right? Uh, however, the way I see it is, um, I see it as to why we are trying to implement mobility as a service solutions is that it's a policy problem. Mm -hmm. Cities in India are inherently complex in nature. So, transit-oriented development in the country is being seen as an afterthought. And I think uh, having mobility as a service and, you know, even thinking about it becomes imperative for our policymakers and urban planners in the country. Um, and yes, it is the need of the hour. We have, we have invested heavily in the infrastructure. Um, I think now what is needed is investment in the digitization of these systems. Um, of the infrastructure, in fact. Yeah, that's all I want to add to this discussion. Thank you. But Cassius, you say very clearly, uh, it's mass is a solution to a policy problem. Mm -hmm. And if the customers are better off, then all the better, all the easier to sell for the policymakers. <laughs> Mm 
Well, the way we want to do it is more complex. Okay, yeah. I agree with you. It's a complex system. Yeah, yeah. And complex system exhibits behavior that you cannot intend or you cannot specify a priori because of the interaction among all these components. And if you add a human being whose behavior is absolutely impossible to specify, you got even a sort of problem. However, uh, like Dr. Fida said, we build them adaptively which means we have the ability to embed enough things in order for us to mitigate impact of bad things when they happen. I think that's the design. The complexity is tamed with that ability. Do we solve all the problems? No. I mean, if you look at what, what the United States, I, I, I hate this argument of the United States, when they go and drop bombs on countries, and then you say, why did you kill this baby? I say, well, this is casual war, uh, yeah, yeah, collateral stuff. And I said, what, what do you mean collateral stuff? Did you, did you know that there is a risk for you to kill that baby? Yes. Then it should have stopped. Ethically, you can't, right? I mean, I, I, remember, I remember one day uh, a lady in the United States lost her son in Vietnam. And she said, I don't care how many people died. Million, I don't care. What I care about is I lost my son. And for her, that, and then the world collapsed in there. So those are the difficult issues that we're making. Is if we know that the system is going to break, we know that bad things will happen. The question is how we deal with it. Yes. Yeah, I just want to add one point uh, related to policy and regulation. Um, I remember when there was uh, a lot of talk about uh, using drones as, uh, um, as services and application especially delivering goods and parcels in uh, urban areas. And then the technology was there. People, they know how to, how to, how to pilot uh, the drones. Companies uh, showing interest to do that. And uh, they're ready to, for deployment. The only thing we're waiting is regulation and policy. They say, oh, wait, we have to develop first regulation and policy. And this was the responsibility of uh, civil aviation authorities uh, around the world. But uh, if you look at mass, because you go back to mass, uh, if you look at the airlines, uh, the, the, the airline industry, where do they have some kind of uh, a little bit more advanced uh, um, example of, of really mobility as a service? Uh, when you buy your ticket, you have, you have uh, the offer you service all the way from, sometimes from your home all the way to the hotel by taking a shuttle, then uh, taking uh, um, a, um, uh, a flight, then there is a um, there is train waiting for you, uh, and then a taxi driver will, will, uh, will drop you at the, and maybe they also uh, purchase for you the hotel, and then they rent you a car the, the day after. So all this is can be offered in, in a package uh, with different services. And uh, because there was a talk about last mile mobility, but actually it's, we're talking about the global mobility. And I think uh, um, airline is a little bit more advanced because technology is there. It's very well advanced. Uh, autonomy is there. It's very advanced. We have autonomous, like, uh, doctor, you were uh, mentioning this, um, uh, the autopilot uh, mode. Um, so I think they are advanced. And also regulation and policy very well advanced because uh, what is in stake is a lot more than what we have in urban mobility or uh, urban transportation. So I think maybe if, we'll, if we take the airline as a benchmark and we start looking at the cities as our skies and regulating the traffic, uh, because right now we don't have really a regulation in the cities, right? Uh, sometimes we have like pollution index, so we say, oh, okay, uh, during the summer, this area, we're going to stop cars or uh, uh, the uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, we open it on uh, the weekends for uh, pedestrians only. But there isn't really a regulation. There isn't uh, like um, 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 like an uh, like a uh, uh, like traffic transportation index. Uh, we leave it to the drivers to decide how they want to decide. So maybe if we can, uh, maybe this is an example to to meditate on and. Uh, to look at the regulation aspect from that point of view. That's the, the, that's the hard part. Yeah. Because I think Mass does a little bit more than what the airplane are doing right now. Where the airplane is giving you a journey, but the airplane does not allow you. For example, if I booked a bus ticket and I missed the bus, 
I don't want to take the metro or take something else. It's nearly impossible now. I have to go and do that on my own. Let's assume that what he, Dr. Muhammad is, uh, is talking about is I have an integrated system, fully integrated system. Instead of me sitting there and waiting five, actually somebody used the example, one of them, five hours for a bus to take or a seat, I can use this ticket or this badge or whatever it is and be able to rebook something across a different, different airline. So that requires that all the airline look at this, this mass transportation as a mass transportation and allow you to, yes, exactly. So now you're having optimized system from the provider perspective because in your case, if the airplane is not working, there could be another plane, the other plane would not be working, and yet you cannot use that service. But that requires the type of problems that he raised because you have different stakeholders driven by different purposes, driven by competition, all that stuff, and you would like to have a coherent, you know, comprehensive system to solve this mass problem all the time. I think that is a, a good thing, but for me, that the fact that the forgetting the public transportation now because the focus is not there and focusing only on autonomous drives and what it can do for giving you opportunity to get uh, to transportation as you see fit. They forget the economical other stuff and then the people who don't have cars, they don't solve that problem per se. So full integration, that's what's required. And the question is how do we do it within the socio-economical framework that currently exists? Okay, if I, if I may build on that. Yes. Okay, so first, Helsinki. Okay. Why didn't mass really work in Helsinki? Okay. And actually, at the end, it's quite simple. Because the local bus operator refused to share their data with the mass platform. Okay. And the local bus operator, belonging to the government, had a lot of clout. And, uh, and, and then they had to go to the national government to legislate to force the local bus operator, which was continuing to drag its feet, and ultimately there was no business case anymore. So, so that's exactly a, 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 it's a good illustration. And yeah. now I want to add something. What we are trying in what we are trying in Switzerland, but I have a question whether it will work. But the idea is to force by legislation, the law will go into Parliament uh, this year still, by legislation to share all the transport operators to share their data in what they call a uh, national data infrastructure for mobility. Okay? And then on that basis, I'm sure you're lobbying for it, on that basis, the, the, app op, the app solutions could then use this data to offer to offer uh, m mobility solutions. Of course, this is lobbying on all the sides. Uh, you know, we're, it will go through Parliament. Parliamentarians will decide on, as a result of lobbying. But at least there is an idea to somehow create a data, a common infrastructure. They call it infrastructure, like any other, in the public interest which then you know can be used to offer mobility services in, in this way i'm not sure what comes out of the parliamentarian but at least it's an idea yeah. worth discussing i find wow so you have like a knowledge common of data that could yeah. be shared well but how do we do privacy for that <laughs> uh, because because i mean they, they, that's one of their concern it will be anonymized wh wh whatever but still i mean and they say the argument is which i don't buy totally but the argument is since it's a public infrastructure run by the government <laughs> Um, you know, it will be in the general interest, and privacy will be con will be uh, things like that. Okay, so so that's the that that's the the argument that that goes with it. Um, but but I find the idea of somehow looking looking at digital sort of disentangling this digitalization and say, okay, there is a digital infrastructure like a train track. And then there is services like trains using the train track. We do the same thing for, for, for the digital layer. And we, as a public service, provide the data layer. And then the operators, they can provide the services that go. And that's private, and that's commercial, and innovative, and things like that. It's at least worth a thought. So how are you doing on time? Uh, we didn't explore the business aspect. Do we? Huh? 
Ten more minutes. I, do we have economists here? Because I'm really clueless. Maybe Fadi, who creates startups. No, I do. So, so I brought up the issue that there is a, a, a high value proposition here. The question is, I did never seen it well articulated. And what type of business model is it going to be? Like a centralized? It's going to be some sort of a regulated, federated type of model, or it's going to be open model? You if answer. anybody can, ah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> so to answer that question, uh, for example, in Bangalore, uh -huh. the biggest loss for the uh, uh, Bangalore Metro Transport Corporation uh -huh. is spill fridge. Their operations are so not optimized that they're losing money just by having buses purely lobbying. Like uh -huh. a local government representative wants a bus in that area, but nobody is using it. So that's their maximum loss. And now they, they know it or they don't do anything about it. Or there is no system, which a centralized system, which can showcase it to the entire like, department or to the world, right? So they don't have an IT system. Even today, uh, Bangalore is supposed to be the tech capital for the entire world. Mm -hmm. They give paper-based tickets. And mass, for an example, is a, pr uh, uh, you know, can be a value add there because people are constantly every day morning like when I used to go to office this was one common question should I leave before the P car should I take my car or should I use my public transport or should I go in shared uh, uh, you know car or Uber so this is a common question that they face because the traffic jams are so high but there tech providers cannot uh, solve that challenge because there are a lot of other environmental challenges or ec I mean mm -hmm. ecosystem itself does not support but ma that's why mass was developed by technologists not by uh, transport operators not the government not the regulators so now the tech providers that have built it now use it so they're trying to celebrate the uh, people they don't understand what to do with it yeah. but I'm a little bit of an economist I mean institutional economics where I see the business model, but you have to answer, you are ultimately doing the business with it. I think mass, the business model for mass is to sell solutions to the public sector and to get the public sector to subsidize or create the conditions that the business works. Less pollution, less congestion, more, ro more space in the road, whatever kind of thing. The ultimate customer, I'm totally convinced now, is, is the public sector. And the public sector has to create the conditions that the business model will become. And the public sector profits. You give them back the data, you give them back plenty of things so they, that they can do better planning, uh, be, be, better, better you know, allocation of resources and things like that. But that's how I see where the business ultimately is. Yeah, oh, yes. to answer that question, like uh, taking Bangalore as an example again, Bangalore has lost close to uh, maybe I think 500 million US dollars in the past four years just to operating their uh, public transport operations, right? The 500 million dollars is coming from taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. wow. So now if they use better services, so they can at least save, not make money, at least save those 500 million dollars that can be used to provide even better services, mm -hmm. maybe e-bikes, maybe, you know, having fancy things so it's for us personally as a company mm -hmm. it's not about making profit for the public transport operators at least not make loss so that you don't waste taxpayers money wow well, good so, uh, just to um, to enrich the debate and uh, and and give it a counter example uber for example which uh, is not really worried about the congestion and about the uh, planning and exa uh, um, I don't know about that. No, no, we have data. <laughs> we have very good data. 30% traffic added. I think Uber only took the place of the taxi drivers. <laughs> no, they, they even absorb traffic from the metro. Yeah, so it's, it's like you're, you're, you're creating another layer of taxi drivers that doing the work and the other the, the taxi drivers are just sitting there or or roaming around yes you're right so but what i i what i want to point out is that uber 
directly went to the customer, the end customer, and offered the solution. And it's not based on creating or minimizing or uh, the congestion, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new value proposition for, it's a profit. It's for profit. So, and, and it's very successful for Uber. So uh, that's the, um, I, I and, and most of the regulator are happy with it. Nobody yeah. was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in the beginning in Europe, I know they were, in some places they were forbidding. Uh, it was a le an illegal activity at the beginning, but very quickly it, it become. Uh, Understand, and I'll give you another example. Understand me correctly, I'm not uber bashing or any they have brought innovation they have there are, there are plenty of things but we and and th they understand it themselves because they now say okay how can we work with the city authority together you know to solve and and maybe we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't take the traffic away from the metro we should rather serve the suburban areas and things like that the example i want to illustrate because we wrote that with my colleague for the european parliament blah blah car you may know blah blah car yes okay Blah blah car. We we have excellent data from France and Spain, where we can show that blah blah car takes traffic away from public transport. Okay, in Spain it's the public buses, and in France it's the trains. And the argument maybe it's better. Okay, but the infrastructure, the public transport, still has to be financed. And we are raising the argument. The European Parliament is raising the argument. How does some of that money? that is made by the private platforms feed back into the urban or into the national infrastructure system so it can go, be go better because it's going to be a vicious circle the trains are going to get worse and worse there will be thinner and less and less trains more and more will go to uh, to blah blah car and that goes against the policy of you know f uh, favoring uh, i mean decarbonization and things like that so these kind of things have to be thought. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, do you want to say something? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I will say it from a different background. You are all mostly in the IT and business. I am from the architecture and urban planning. So I think there is a pre-assumption of fixed need in the mass production of things. While people like things to be more customized towards their needs, that's why Uber and Karim got to be more um, common for people to use. They don't like things to be imposed on them as they are. They like to have margin of flexibility. So that choice of things is missing in the mass production of things. So the, the need is a kind of pre-assumed on those mass lines of things. Uh, while people don't like things to be uh, fixed, they, li they don't like rigidity of things, especially when they, don't, when they feel overwhelmed of dealing with them. Uh, they like to be individually served, and I think um, people will go into uh, the services that they feel some sort of control on using them, rather than they are controlled in using them. Does that speak so for mass or against mass? Uh, I am with the human kind of service. <laughs> so I like to feel that people feel the autonomy of using the service, rather than they it is like well, that's it what is not strike to do it, give them choices it's not take it or leave it it has to have some sort of flexibility oh, in its okay. offering okay. because otherwise you will not have people okay. using it you are expelling people yes. from the system you want them to I be agree. part of I the agree. system yes. so you want them to be engaged in making the decision in the service that you are producing for them yes it's not a network that applies on everybody yeah. so you so the concept is okay it's the way it's going to be built designed yeah. and offered to the people that has to have the buy-in from yeah, the people yeah that's why yes. it cannot work as a universal system yes. it has to be contextualized for each place for according each to the culture to the identity to the privacy to to the topography to the uh, morphology all those items need to work together very oh, good sorry point. to take you yeah. to different directions. I don't know. That's a great no, point. It's, it's the same direction. I wish we can end on that point. <laughs> it's, it's, okay. the it's the same direction, just, yes. just to underscore your point, you know? I mean, maybe blah blah car is good in remote areas, you know? Maybe Uber is good in the night when there is no metro, you know? It's, it's, you have to... <laughs> You have to have an integrated view of, of these kind of things. So 
in some moments it is more efficient to have mass transit and cram everybody into the train because that's the more cost effective and then in the rural areas in the in the in the hours in the late hours in the weekends it's it's more flexible it's better it's more cost efficient to have a an, a, a more individualized system and things like that. Absolutely. I mean, we, we have this, the, the ones of you who know Switzerland, you know, we have these post buses who do 50% of the distribution, the public transport in Switzerland, and they're huge and they're driving empty. And it's better, it would be better to have a taxi for the few individual customers late at night when they drive empty, you know. But planning, <laughs> planning wise, I don't want to make it an argument, but planning wise, you don't want to treat urban areas the same as you treat rural areas. Otherwise, you are sprawling everything the same. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't okay. work okay, uh, okay. Uh, climate wise, yeah, yeah, environment point. wise. Good point. Excellent. Good point. Yeah. But okay. the whole planet uh, is just urban. Just uh, you you <laughs> have the last, the last yes. comment here. Yes. <laughs> just the flexibility part of it. Uh, ah. I'll, I'll add one sentence. Not, uh, ah. So. What the public transport has now is the classical version. We have the fixed bus stops. Of course, we are not going to change the whole fixed train stations. Uh -huh. But in order to introduce flexibility, uh, maybe thinking out of the box, like uh, dynamic bus stations that can just see the demand through the mass platform and then move the bus station. Now, this is the point where the bus would just come and pick you up. Thank so you. So that's basically. Thank you. Okay. So I wanna I wanna do this quickly. Three questions. By show of hand, do you think mass will happen? If you believe that, raise your hand. What question? Will mass happen? Will mass happen, or is this hype? Wow. Okay. Do you think mass is a solution really for the rural area as opposed to the urban area? No. No. It's for both. No, no, but, 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 but do you at least believe that it will help? When I say it would happen, it's a good idea for that purpose. No. Yes. Does it serve better the rural area now where people cannot afford to have cars? What does the rural area require? What, what is it the need people, of the rural people area? People cannot move. I told well, they you have their cars. North, no, uh, in Arizona, I've seen young Indians that have to walk miles before they get to the library so they can do their homework. They require a tailored solution then. Huh? They, they require a tailored solution for those. They can't buy cars. In the United States, you can't buy cars. We go for tailored solution for those specific cases, maybe. Yeah. But yeah. something that is important, we, we didn't talk about it, is the PPP, especially when we talk about infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. But this he, he had to answer, I mean, we can discuss later. He had this question. But, but you know, these rural Indians, they have been disenfranchised for centuries before. Yes, and that this last kilometers is just the latest yes. thing, problem they encounter. So, okay. <laughs> All righty. So uh, uh, I would like to personally thank the, the, the Swiss people, including the producer and his assistant. So please give them a hand because they did a wonderful job. Thanks. My thanks all to everybody who put a lot of efforts. Dr. Manzoor, where is he? Yeah. Dr. Fadi, Dr. Fida, and everybody else who's here. And uh, Maris, thank okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And then, but he's part of the Swiss Pavilion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he will conclude, yes. but thank you, thank you very much. And Perfect. then I would like to thank you very much. And then the last word goes to you. Arthur. No, I think Dr. Fida still, no? Uh, no, can you say a few few remarks? Uh, I, I think we're done. You just want to uh, talk about li like thank you all for coming, and yeah. I think um, it's time for dinner. I don't want to keep you any longer. Thanks to everyone. You already <laughs> uh, you already thanked everyone. So also thank you to the audience who uh, participated in this uh, event. Okay. Thank okay. You. So I'm going to call upon you to give me something to put in the report. And I wish you would contribute something, especially, I mean, your, your, your point is great. I mean, I would love to see you talk about this, this uh, modularization of the service to serve specific need as opposed to like a blanket or a size fits all type of an approach. <laughs> Good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, so thank you very much to all of you who attended the session, our colleagues from UAEU.
Rapef and Middle East, Igros, for making this uh, reality. We hope that a very interesting report will be able to be so. published from this. Thank you also to, to my colleagues who were able to, uh, to make the session a success. And as announced, and I think someone is very hungry, we have uh, a road networking reception with a few snacks and some, uh, some drinks outside. So you're welcome to enjoy our beautiful rooftop. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait.